Hello, Scream Demons, and welcome to the Screams from the Basement podcast with Sam and Casey. This is a bi-weekly horror podcast in which two horror fans discuss all things horror, including news, recent watches, horror collectibles, and more. I am one of your co-hosts, Casey. And I'm Sam. And, and let's, let's get, get screaming. screaming! We've got a bunch of stuff to scream about this week. We have so much to scream about. I'm so excited for this episode. We I've have been so much to for this episode. We have so much to scream about. You could call us Matthew Lillard and Skeet Ulrich. That's <laughs> how much we have to scream about. Yes. This is a this is a massive episode. If you've seen the title of this episode, you might know what's about to happen next. Maybe. Do we do we just come out with it? We have to. I mean, yeah. we, we did this a couple, I mean, this is a couple months ago now that we did this. So for mm-hmm. those of you that don't know, Sam and I are the coordinators for the Supercon Film Festival in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It is our third year proper of doing the film festival that, there. It is the eighth year overall of Supercon. It is set to be our biggest event ever. Huge. Yes. Massive. Huge. It's, it's so big, we had to, as Supercon, as an organization, we had to add a whole nother building. Yeah. That's how big it's going to be. No no joke. We added another building this year. That's how big it is. We, a few months ago, announced one of our first guests for the film festival portion of Supercon, which was Caroline Williams from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, Leprechaun 3, 10 Minutes to Midnight. So many great, great horror films. Scream Queen, icon of horror. But we ain't done. No. We didn't just stop at one icon of horror. Because we did not. We Sam, I'm, I, I'm going to give this one to you. Because oh, God. obviously it means so much to both of us. Yeah. But we have met this next guest that we are about to announce. Yep. At Halloween Palooza, I believe yep. two years ago now. Yep. Sam, who is the next guest for our film festival and for Supercon? You guys, I literally can't believe I'm saying this. I have chills right now. Like, my face is getting a little flushed if you're not watching the video. Uh, guys, we got Kelly Maroney coming Kelly to Supercon. Kelly freaking Maroney, guys. Kelly Maroney herself. Like, one of my all-time favorite Scream Queens. Maybe maybe my all-time favorite Scream Queen. Uh, yeah. We've got, we've got Kelly Maroney. Like, Chopping Mall. Night of the Comet. Fast Times at Ridgemont High, The Zero Boys, Sorority Babes at the Slime Bowl, Valorama 2. All movies that we're probably going to be talking about later in this episode. So as you saw at the, at the whenever you clicked on this either video, the podcast, however you're listening or watching this, you saw the title, Kelly Maroney Movies. That's the topic, mm-hmm. and we are going to be celebrating both, you know, one of our favorite Scream Queens of all time. Again, another horror icon. Yes. And a delightful human being. Kelly is so nice. We both, like I said, had a chance to meet her a couple years ago at Halloween Palooza. She was such a delight to, to she have even there. She took and a chat picture with. of me while I was dripping sweat. Sam was the sweatiest <laughs> and the whitest I have ever seen him. <laughs> I was not doing well. <laughs> But it was good. It was it was it was, it was so fun. fun. She was so nice to talk to. She had an amazing panel there as well. Yeah. Which was I think we we have speculations on that. She did a panel yes. with Brink Stevens, um, another horror icon screen yep. queen, who starred and, in the original Sorority Babes in the Slime Ball Bolorama, who directed Sorority Babes 2. And what? has a cameo in it. Yes. More than yes. I think more than a cameo. She's a character in yeah, it. Yeah, she actually is a full on character. Um, Yeah, we saw her announce that she would be directing a sequel to Sorority Babes, and Kelly was on that panel, and Kelly perked up at that, and a few years later, Sorority Babes 2 came out, and Kelly Maroney was in it. We're thinking there was an origin. Maybe yeah. in Iowa. It might have happened in, in uh, Ottumwa, Iowa. It might have happened in Ottumwa, Iowa. And that's, that's, pretty, that's kind of crazy. Cool. That's, that's kind of crazy. Um, we're, we're very excited to have Kelly um, come to the festival. Not only that, I'm just going to say it here, Sam. We didn't really talk about this, but we, we do yeah. have a movie that... At, okay, at least one Kelly Maroney movie. We're working yes. on another one, guys. We're working on it. We'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. If it happens, we'll announce it on the show. But the first Kelly Maroney movie we are going to be showing for sure... Yes. 
is The Haunted Baby Carriage from Hell. It is a short film that Kelly stars in. She is incredibly funny in it, as yes. we're talking about in many of her movies. She is super funny. She is very funny in this movie. It's a short film. I believe it's, I don't know, 10 minutes long, something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Long. Uh, we are going to be showing that at Supercon as well, and I'm very excited for it. She does a, a fantastic job. Um, so we're, we're excited to have the Haunted Baby Carriage from Hell playing as part of our film festival with Kelly Maroney there. Super cool. She's going to be there all weekend. We're working on panels with her, hopefully a Q&A for the film festival as well. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're super pumped. I mean, we're dedicating this entire episode to her announcement and to her, her career, which is a, yes. a, a career that we're going to be talking about a little bit later on in the show. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, she's got... <sighs> I mean, she started in soaps, moved into horror cinema, and then for a while was kind of doing the convention circuit, I feel like, and kind of similar to Barbara and Caroline in the recent say, decade has kind of had a resurgence. Yeah, like most Scream Queens, for some reason, that 90s, early 2000s era was... I don't know, kind of a wasteland for Scream Queens. And now Do you think it's because we were getting new ones? Like Daniel Harris was really fully embracing horror at that time. And, and you know Nev, what I mean? Nev Campbell was you coming got up. Nev Campbell, yeah. yeah. I, I wonder if that's kind of why. Like maybe it's a little cyclical. It's definitely the era that it came that that, that was in, you know, the nineties, yeah. early two thousands. When you think of Scream Queens, it's usually in the slasher genre. Mm -hmm. what slasher movies were coming out it was the ones where you could plaster the 20 somethings faces all over them and yeah. get them to you know get get that target audience the teen heartthrobs to come yes out. yeah the denise richards <laughs> yes the, the the valentine valentine is for sure one of those movies yeah, absolutely but i think we'll, let's 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 talk about that later cuz i do want to talk about it for especially the 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 two um, icons that we are bringing in Kelly and Caroline. I think they've both seen a bit of a, a resurgence in the last decade. Absolutely. And I love seeing that because they are incredible performers. Both, both of them have, have standout performances in the last, even in the last five years, I think in their careers. Oh, yeah. And I think we, we, we can touch on both of them a little bit. Well, maybe we'll do a Caroline episode down the, down the we road. We should do, we should do a Caroline episode, like closer to Supercon. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely. Yeah, we'll do it. We're yeah, going yeah, to do it. Absolutely. She's got she's got so many fun movies that I'd love to talk about. Yeah. So, so. we'll we'll do uh, Kelly Maroney movies here today. We're going to be talking about all of them, even some of the non horror ones. I think we are going to touch on those as well, just because we, we're, we're going to try to cover as much of her career as as possible. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Sam, um, we're, we got a little bit of a change in our format. Um, we yeah. are kind of getting. We're going to. Sort of get rid of seller news, but not. Yeah. We're going to not touch on every single piece of news unless it's like, we need to talk about this. Yeah. And this week there's, I mean, they announced Terrifier 3. I'm very excited for that. We'll talk about that when we do a Terrifier episode down the road. Yep. We're going to do that. that was, that's that's one that's definitely on our docket. But Sam, there's one piece of news that um, really grinds your gears. To yeah, it really Peter grinds Griffin. my gears. You know what really grinds my gears? <laughs> Uh, One of my yeah. favorite Peter Griffin jokes. Shout out Family Guy. Can I just read verbatim what I put in the show notes? Yeah. Because that's that's how I feel. Let's okay, guys. The only piece of news I want to touch on is that non-UK evil deadheads are getting fucking hosed. <laughs> with Lee Cronin's commentary being exclusive to the UK Blu-ray release. What so is, I, that? I what have, is that? I have a theory about that, Sam. Okay. My theory is, and with any Blu-ray media release, with any movie nowadays, it's planned months in advance, especially yeah. for a studio movie. Evil Dead Rise was supposed to be a HBO Max, or Max, whatever the hell it's called. That's true. They might release. not have a whole bunch of stuff. And so I'm, one, yeah, I'm wondering if that's part of it, is that they just didn't plan to have special features at all. Yeah, I'm sure there is. There obviously is behind the scenes stuff, and maybe they'll include that with a future release. One, I'm just gl I'm glad that this is getting a media release at all. I mean, yes. that it helps obviously. That's not that a it, given these days. It's not. It helps that it is a theatrical release. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I, th I think that's the biggest part of it. I think we, I, I hope we get a bigger release down the road. I, I'm, I am disappointed. I will still be picking this up. Oh, but yeah. as soon as an, a newer release comes out years down the road that has audio commentary from Lee Cronin, behind the scenes featurettes, maybe even audio commentary from Bruce and Sam do it, you know, talking about mm -hmm. the movie. Oh, audio commentary from Alyssa Sutherland. Yeah. I want to hear all about that. <laughs> so I, I, I think that'll eventually be coming. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I think it's it's kind of ridiculous nowadays that you yeah. can't at least put an audio commentary? Like, yeah, like that's the on. least you can do. It's recorded. Just put it on all of them. <laughs> Lee Cronin, if you're listening, come on our show. We will do an audio commentary with you for oh the Blu-ray for free. God. We will do it. This is yeah. just a, a shameless plug. Lee, if you are listening, come on the show. And we we'll watch Evil Dead Rise. We'll watch Evil Dead Rise with you. We'll ask all the nerdy questions. Yeah. And they can throw it on the Blu-ray. I've got plenty of them. All right, so get ready for our next episode in two weeks. That will be an Evil Dead Rise commentary with <laughs> commentary Lee with Lee Cronin. <laughs> you heard it here first. Card subject to change. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's 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 it for seller news. Yeah, I'm with you, Sam. I'm with you. I just I don't know. That bummed me out. I was like, come on, come on. So Warner Brothers, if you're listening, not that you give a shit because you gutted Max. Um. Yeah. Just... Yeah. Forgetting the the entire selling point of their streaming service <laughs> is not the Max part of it. It's the also, HBO part of it. Not to get too off topic, but oh my god, this new app is not good. I don't like the new layout. I think it's super unuser friendly. I like. I... There's three buttons now on the left, and everything is in one button, and it sucks. <laughs> I like part of it because I I like that I get the discovery stuff all on it. Yeah. Because I do like watching like Food Network or I love watching Ghost Adventures. It's yeah. shamelessly one of my favorite TV shows. That's fair. I love having that on there. I don't love the creators thing that I think they fixed yeah. now. I, I think hope they, they fixed, fixed it. it. That was oh. awful. Um, but I like it. Uh, it. It's still a better user friendly interface than like paramount or peacock which are both like terribly slow and take forever to to work i disagree but mm, maybe it's I, just my maybe it's just my apps i don't know i maybe. i also have an, a vendetta against peacock because it took away the wwe network and that was like the best streaming service ever <laughs> and made it so boring and bland and for some reason gave <sighs> wrestlemania seasons man see i love the cock the cock is my favorite streaming service at the moment. Okay, maybe not my favorite. Shutter and Screenbox are still right there. But <laughs> it's my favorite non-horror one. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's got the monsters, man. That's all I need. <laughs> yeah, but so does so does Tubi. Yeah, but I can watch it without it. <laughs> Tubi's Tubi is low key the best streaming service. Yeah. Ever. Actually, I've been watching a crap ton of Tubi recently. Yeah. Which we'll talk about a bunch of stuff that I watched mm -hmm. on Tubi. Yeah. Yeah, like this this week's episode brought to you by Tubi and Shudder, and that's about it. <laughs> and that's it. Well, I have I have well you might have a few that okay, are off of... honestly most of them are from from from, <laughs> from Tubi online. <laughs> yeah. Uh the only thing I have to add from Casey's toy box this week. Yes. Is one thing um, we are getting Return of the Living Dead reaction figures from Super Seven. Sam, did you see these? Um, yes, I did. I saw them. You you know my like I watched this movie for the first time a little maybe a year ago or so, mm -hmm. and it just didn't hit with me. Um, I do want to see it with a crowd or with like at least a group of people, um, just to see if it changes because I know sometimes. Watching horror. Sam movies wants alone. to watch the movie with me. That's that's yeah. What he's yeah, yeah, essentially, because it just didn't didn't hit for me. That said, character design, like the zombie design in that movie, is next level, super cool, and the you know the Super Seven action figures are pretty cool representations of that. We we've talked about this many times on on the show when we were talking about uh, action figure lines that both of us are like nah on the reaction lines from from Super Seven. It's the price point I think for yep. us. 
anything on I think on anything under twenty dollars I would be okay with. It's mm -hmm. it's just twenty bucks is a bit too steep for what what you get out of these. But they look great. I love I love the movie. Return of the Living Dead is easily one of my favorite zombie movies ever. It, it might be my favorite. I don't know. It's up there for me. It's definitely up there. I love that movie. We're we'll have to cover it at some point. Maybe we'll do the return series, all three of the movies. Ooh, that one. would be fun. There's that only would be fun. three, right? Yeah, I yeah. think so. I think there's only three. Yeah. So maybe we'll we'll have to do those down the road and and talk about them a little bit more. Yeah, we'll add an unofficial fourth one. Just also cover Scout's Guide. We'll we'll make we'll make we'll make a fourth one like it's always sunny when they made Lethal Weapon five and six. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, we should. But that's it should, for. Yeah, go ahead. Go Sorry, ahead I was about to say, and then we should totally show it to a group of high school kids to see what they think of it. Yeah. <laughs> Sam will do, be doing the graveyard dance in the fourth one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will. Yeah, one hundred percent. But that's it. That's no, it. For, I was gonna make another joke. I can't. That's it for toys. I'm cutting you off, Sam. Yeah, cut I, me I, off. Cut me off. I'm I have a feeling. I, I know where that joke's going, and that we, yeah. we don't need that on the internet. Yeah, I'm about to. I'm about to say something wildly inappropriate. So, Casey, <laughs> what are Sam. you doobie doing? <laughs> what am I doobie doing, Sam? Yeah, I want to start off doobie doing with before we get to recent watches because we have a lot of crossover between those, and mine are kind of actually like themed. My yeah. watches. I'm gonna talk about stuff I picked up recently. Yeah. The first one I'm going to talk about, I didn't tell you about this yet because I needed your reaction right away. Oh, God. Okay? We talked about okay. this a few episodes ago. Uh-huh. I found him. Oh, no way, dude. I found the Casey Jones as the no Phantom way. of the Opera, NECA, Ninja Turtles, Universal Monster crossover. Where did you find him? So all of these came from Watertown, South Dakota. The thrift store you went to? This was at the Target. So we oh, went to okay. Target while we were there because I was like, I'm going to look. We're yeah, here. Just in case. Their NECA and collectible section is, well, one of the Sioux Falls Targets doesn't even have that section anymore. It's just Funko no. Pops. The other one has a very small section. This one was jam-packed with stuff. There was at least five Casey Jones there. That's so insane to me that Watertown has a better <laughs> collectible. Me too, than and I've I've noticed that at other small small town targets where they have a crazy selection of of Neca's and Funkos and you know more collectible type of action figures, and Sioux Falls has like nothing. It's weird. I don't understand it. Target corporate. I would like to talk to your manager, please. <laughs> but no, this action figure rules. It's incredible. Um, it's it's the only one I'm probably going to get from this line. That's really dope, dude. Yeah, this this figure rules. As soon as I saw it, I'm like, this is coming home with me. I need it. But yeah, the rest of the stuff was from a thrift store in Watertown, South Dakota. Um, I picked up a couple VHS tapes. One of them you have, which is from Dust oh. Till Dawn. Yes, not within arm's reach, but yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, mine, I picked up Jeepers Creepers. I know you don't like yeah. this movie for reasons I understand. Yeah. I like this movie a lot. Didn't have it on VHS. Hey, These... a thrift store VHS buy does not in any way support any of the people that made that, so I'm good with it. No, that 50 cents <laughs> went to some independent dealer in Watertown. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sam, you're going to flip over the next couple, I think. Uh, I picked up Idle Hands. On VHS. I love this movie. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Obviously oh! going to be watching it on VHS. Dude. Super you excited. have to invite me over. I haven't seen it on VHS yet. It's All right. a great VHS movie. <laughs> uh, the next ones I haven't watched either. I picked up Christopher Walken's The Prophecy. Ooh, okay. I've never even heard of that one. I've only heard of it because it's always like with like multi-pack... Uh, DVDs at Walmart, usually with yep. Hellraiser. Really? <laughs> but this this is the demo tape from like the video store. Oh my god, that's cool. That's I don't know, kind of cool. I always love getting those. And then I the like last, my VHS have like rental stickers. Yeah. On them. <laughs> like not for resale. Yeah. <laughs> um, the last one I have, I've never heard of this movie. It is a. 
a vampire oh. movie. Is this the one that you messaged? No, I, I didn't buy that one. The, the tape was shot on oh. that one. I don't, re- I don't even remember what the name of it was. Wasn't it, was it like called a... like Soul Survivor? But it was like S-O-U-L? Yeah, I think it so. It had a Danishka... Esther... No. What's what's the girl's name from Wrong Turn? Eliza... I don't know. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name. But yeah, I know that... It was like a '90s, early 2000s scream yeah. ripoff. Yeah, yeah. Um, this I assume came around that same time. I had never heard of this. It is the breed. Okay. Oh yeah, that's definitely of that time. Yeah. The color palette, the poster, everything. Uh, yeah. I just noticed it has Supercon guest as the star, Adrian Paul. Oh, that's is cool. <laughs> I just noticed that. Uh, you can have him sign it. Have him sign my breed VHS tape. It's a vampire <laughs> movie. I've never heard of this. That's I'm awesome. like, yeah, 50 cents. Why not? This is probably streaming on Tubi too, but I'm like, I'll buy the VHS tape instead. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. That's uh, awesome, the, dude. The last thing, big boy purchase here. You can see it right behind me. The reason we went to Watertown. Mm. So one this, this thrift store we went to, shout out Andy Erickson. One of our movie buddies who told us about this thrift store that has like an entire top part of their store that looks like an old video rental store. Yep. And they're selling all these like pop up displays from Disney movies and 90s action movies. They had a ton of posters, laser discs, a few VHS tapes. Um, yeah, just a bunch of stuff from the store. And so I was like, I'm, I'm going to pick through this stuff. I didn't buy any big displays because they're massive. Obviously, they fit into a video store. Um, (laughs) But I picked up two posters. Uh, One side is... I don't know how I'm going to display these, but... Dr. Mordred. Hell yeah. Yeah. You you can kind of see it. it. You can look it it up. Look it up on IMDb. Look up the poster art. (laughs) Uh, Both of these are full moon. Hell yeah. Uh, And the other one is Trancers 3. Which... Have you seen both of those movies? I've seen Dr. Mordred. I have only seen the first Trancers. Okay. Okay. But I was like, these are full moon posters for 10 bucks yeah. for both of them. I'm buying them. I like the first Trancers a lot. I like Dr. Dr. Mordred. Hell yeah. Which is That's awesome, Char- dude. Charlie, Charlie Band's uh, Dr. Strange knockoff. <laughs> starring Jeffrey Combs. So. Jeffrey Combs is a Dr. Strange knockoff? Yes. Where he's I'm Doctor gonna, Strange, yeah. I'm gonna watch that. We can we we should do an episode, another full moon. Sorry, people, we're gonna do another <laughs> full moon episode at some point. We'll yeah. talk Doctor Mordred. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it, it was written as a Doctor Strange movie. Charlie didn't wasn't able to get the rights to Doctor Strange for Marvel in the '90s, so he just made Doctor Mordred instead of Doctor Strange. That's so funny. Yeah, that's very yeah, much. I'm Charlie super excited. Super excited to have these my first full moon posters in the collection. That's a rat, dude. All right. Uh, I'll get to my recent watches now. Hell yeah. Um, before I get to my themed ones, we'll, we'll talk about a couple other ones in here. Uh, I rewatched Rawhead Rex. Hey, there's a Boris cameo. There's a Boris cameo. He is on the table right now. <laughs> Shout out, Boris. Hey, Boris. Um, I watched Rawhead, I Re- rewatched Rawhead Rex. Kayla had never seen it. I like this movie a lot. It is a Clive Barker story. I don't want to say it's a Clive <laughs> Barker movie because he, he he wrote the movie but didn't have anything to do with the actual production of it. Uh, Has this he disowned is, it? Yeah, oh, I think so. Okay. I think so. It's not not a lot like his short story of Rawhead Rex. Uh, but I like this movie. It's a big old monster movie with a person in a giant monster costume and it's a ton of fun and the costume looks okay slash kind of terrible. I love it. It's a fun watch. Kayla had never seen it before. So I I wanted to show it to her. She always likes big, big rubber monster suit (laughs) movies. This movie's this movie is a perfect movie to watch with a bunch of friends and kind of laugh with the movie. It's one of those type of movies. Yeah. Okay. Those are my favorite types of movies, even to watch alone. Mm Mm-hmm. You You'll know, have like, a ton of fun with this movie, Sam. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm excited to watch this. I feel like 
I just missed you guys covering this one on back a lot. Um, yeah. It was right before I came on as like a full time host on the show. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I have to I have to catch up with this one. Uh, the next one I have on my list is a brand new release. Finally watched it. We talked about. Well, you and I didn't talk about this. Me and no. Kayla talked about this on the one episode you were gone. We talked about Last Shift um, from director Anthony de Blasi. And we talked about that movie that came out in 20, 2015, I think. Uh, and we talked about that in depth. I shared my love for it. I love that movie. I think it's terrifying. It's very effective, very small scale. It's a great little indie horror movie. Mm-hmm. So I'm talking about here the recent update to it, the higher budgeted production, Malum. Which yeah. sees Anthony de Blasi return back to the director's seat. It's kind of the same crew. It is the same basic premise. It is about this this rookie cop who is spending a night at this uh, police station that's about to close down. The, the twist on this, or at least what makes it a bit different, is that you show a little bit more of the cult. We get a little bit more of that backstory. We actually get to spend time on there, like the farm that all the people in the cult live on. You spend time there. It opens with that. You also get to see like police riots happening in the streets with mm-hmm. with former cult members, I believe. Okay. Um, but the rest of the story is pretty much pretty much the same. Um, I hate saying this. I didn't like it. I really didn't like it. Uh, I, if you are curious about Malum, I would say just rewatch Last Shift. I think the smaller scale story works better for what it's trying to do. I don't think Malum adds anything to it. If anything, it takes away some of the best parts of Last Shift and what really makes it effective and scary and kind of world building. Whereas this one, you see a bit more of the world, but it doesn't add anything to the world building, if that makes sense. Yeah. A little bit like an escape from New York, escape from L.A. thing where bigger budget doesn't necessarily translate to a better movie. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sometimes, isn't it weird how, like, sometimes those restrained budgets actually, like, and I think it's because they force you to come up with something that's a little more creative, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, And I don't like to diss on acting because I'm not an actor myself, but the main actress in this movie doesn't give that same believability as the actress from the first movie. And it makes me curious why they didn't just bring her back. Yeah. That does seem kind of weird. Yeah. I, I just wish there was different ways the story took. I I wish it wasn't the exact same story, just with a bit of a bigger budget. I don't know. It's, it's, it's unfortunate that this movie is again, it's, it is flying under the radar now that it has come out, but I think the reviews aren't, aren't quite up there. Like, like something like Terrifier 2, I think, is what they were definitely shooting for and like trying to build that type of word of mouth buzz. And yeah. this one just hasn't caught on. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Because, yeah. I mean, I know they had a bit more money for this, but I know it's still very much an independent movie. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's I, that's the nature of it, right? I'm rooting for the production team. It sounds like they're going to be doing some more... Um, horror productions going forward from from Welcome Villain, I believe is the production company. I'm rooting for oh, Anthony yeah. de Blasi, always, always have since I saw Last Shift. Um, yeah. He had a fun little movie called Extremity come out a few years after that. I would recommend checking that out if people haven't seen that one. But cool. a couple other recent watches. These are more themed. You can probably guess the theme out there, people. <laughs> uh, I, I, I watched some Little Creatures Attack movies. So the first one on my list, Gremlins 2, the new batch. I showed my buddy Dakota this. He had only seen the first Gremlins. I told him this was my favorite Gremlins movie. Still hold by that. This movie rules. I love this movie. It's everything I want in it. It is this crazy manic energy throughout. And as soon as the second half starts and the Gremlins start becoming different, really different types of Gremlins, like there's the the Professor Gremlin, there's the the like horny female (laughs) gremlin there's like a batman gremlin that turns into a gargoyle this movie's bonkers it's nuts it's insane have you seen gremlins too i have not so i love the first one i still have not seen the second one and from everything that i've heard like i've had people be like you really need to watch the second Mm -hmm. one because it's way more like 
people have said the second one is way more me. And I'm like, I don't know what that means because the first one is already pretty fucking me. <laughs> the second one so, is way more you. Okay. I'm excited. I, uh, I, like I said, I love the first Gremlins. It's a, uh, it's a classic. Um, there's this Wall Street yuppie as the sort of like anti-hero to the movie <laughs> who owns okay. the high the high rise building that the gremlins attack. Christopher Lee plays a mad scientist. What? Yeah. This movie oh, rules. That's you need awesome. to watch this. Yeah. Okay. God, I'm gonna watch this tonight when we get done. Do it. <laughs> Depending on when we get done, I suppose. Uh I'll try to be quick then so you can watch Gremlins. Too. Oh, no. Uh <laughs> keeping in, in line with that, I watched the Ghoulies trilogy. Okay. I've not seen any of okay. these. Uh, so we watched Ghoulies 1, 2, and 3, back to back to back. I had seen parts of the first Ghoulies. I thought I had never seen it. It turns out I just fell asleep because it's not that good of a movie. It is a, it's a weird movie, Ghoulies, the first one. It is a Empire Pictures production, Charlie Van production. It is... People like to call it a Gremlins knockoff. It was in production the same time as Gremlins just happened to come out the year after. Yeah. The rest of the other ones are more Gremlins. I was knockoffs. about to say Critters is a Gremlins knockoff. Crit Critters is a Gremlins knockoff. Uh what's it? Mun Munchies, I think is another oh, one. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but Hob like Hobgoblins, that's a those are those are Gremlins ripoffs. This one is just so happened to have a it's not even a, it's not really a similar premise. It's just little things attack people. Yeah, I was about to say, like, even character design, there's not a whole lot of similarity to, like, and I haven't seen any of the Ghoulies movies, but I've, like, seen the posters and yeah. stuff. Yeah, everybody's yeah. seen It's a very iconic poster Yeah, the, that doesn't really pay off. It's just one shot in the movie where it's Ghoulie clearly added it, It's clearly added after the rest of the production. Yeah. Where a Ghoulie comes out of the toilet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the movie is more of, like, a satanic cult type of movie. Really? Than a like, little Critters Attack movie. I don't love the first Ghoulies. I know a lot of people do. A lot of people have a lot of fondness for it. I will say Ghoulies 2 is exactly what I want the Ghoulies premise to be. It's set at a carnival. It's set inside the, the carnival rides. There's like a, a like castle funhouse that the Ghoulies are infiltrating. Yes. It's a ton of fun. There's your typical... like business bad guy that's trying to shut down the carnival <laughs> you have a bunch of um like kids getting attacked the teenagers getting attacked inside the the fun house it ends with a giant nine foot tall ghoulie attacking the amusement park it's incredible oh my god that's Ghoul awesome ghoulies two rules you can watch any of these movies in any order it doesn't matter there's no continuity to any any of them that's awesome i'm glad that i We'll talk about another series that I'm glad I didn't skip ahead to two because I seriously considered it. And then after watching one and two, I was like, oh, that would not have been a smart idea. Yeah. These are very linked. <laughs> Though, that series is very linked. Ghoulies yeah. series is not. Especially when you get to Ghoulies 3. Okay. Ghoulies 3 is bonkers. Ghoulies 3, Ghoulies Go to College. Is <laughs> That's a, awesome. I believe it came out in 19... Was it 91? 90 maybe? They should uh, re-release it as another Ghoulie movie. Or another, an, an extremely Ghoulie movie. Extremely yeah. Ghoulie movie. <laughs> that would be a perfect title for this movie. This movie is a 80s, 90s sex, com sex comedy. <laughs> but the Ghoulies are the bumbling idiot Three Stooges knockoffs that are trying to sabotage the main characters, the Animal House type of characters in this. That's awesome. Where the characters are straight ripped from animal house it all takes place during like prank week at this college where these two <laughs> where these two uh, fraternities try to prank each other and steal like a trophy that's that's between them and the angry uh college professor the dean of the college tries to you know stop them because those damn kids so he hires the ghoulies <laughs> who talk in this movie and act like the three stooges Oh to do God. his bidding and stop all the pranking from going on. That's awesome. This movie's nuts. It's maybe a bit too crazy for its that own is, good. I don't know if that's in my vocabulary. I like. Oh, I, 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 I still very much recommend Ghoulies Three. Ghoulies Go to College. It is also the film debut of Matthew Lillard. What? 
For real? For real. That's he is awesome. one of the the hero fraternity. He is like their bottom of the line group. He oh, has no God. lines in it. He has some funny facial reactions, but that's about it. But he's <laughs> in the entire movie. That's so great. Yep. I can't wait to watch these. Also, Kane Hodder plays a janitor at the beginning of the movie. Oh, good for Kane. Yeah. I love seeing Kane pop up and things. Uh, the last one I'll throw out here, and then I think maybe we'll, this is where we can cross over. Yeah. Yeah. I watched on your recommendation. This time, <laughs> yeah. Sam recommended a full moon movie to me. It is hideous, which is sort of a like spiritual sequel to head of the family. Which yeah. We talked about last episode. If you haven't listened to that episode, go back and listen to it right now. It's a, it's a banger of an episode talking about full moon. Hideous. Well, can I, can go I ahead. tell you why I watched this movie? I started re-watching Head of the Family. I watched the Joe Bob presentation, <laughs> right? Yeah. And Charlie Band was like, oh, if you like this movie, I didn't even finish the Joe Bob presentation because Charlie Band goes, oh, if you like this movie, people would love Hideous. And I was like, well, I'm watching Hideous then. Like, I can re-watch Head of the Family another time. I'm going to watch some, you know. Mm -hmm. And about 30 minutes in, I think I texted you. I was like, have you seen this movie? Because it is insane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It is very much okay. I love this movie, Hideous Rules. Yeah, I can't wait to rewatch this again. <laughs> it is a, it is Full Moon's version of House on Haunted Hill. Yeah, it's a '60s Hammer horror. Like you have to expect Vincent Price to pop up in this movie. Yes, it is a. It's about these like collectors of odd artifacts and items, and they are in this bidding war for these hideous creatures that, very early in the movie are sitting in like separate jars. There's like four of them. And like these tentacle things come out of one of them for no reason. Yeah. And they all come to life. Yeah. And start taking over the people, the, the eccentric characters that are in this big giant mansion. Um, including one of our favorite now, I think she's kind of like our new favorite screen, screen yeah. queen, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Lavelle, Lovell. Lavelle, who, is so incredible in this movie. She's just wearing the only thing she's wearing in this movie is this black vest. No it's like shirt. an Aladdin vest if it was made of biker leather. <laughs> yeah, and black shorts. And she has one of the funniest scenes in any full moon movie where, where she, she robs a man at gunpoint, <laughs> topless in a gorilla mask <laughs> with the line I am woman, hear me roar. <laughs> it is so funny, it's so great. It is ridiculously funny. Everybody knows what type of movie they're in in this. The creature effects, I don't think, are as good as something like Demonic Toys or Head of the Family. Yeah. Yeah, or this one's in... a little bit more low budget, I feel like. Yep. Um, yeah, but it, I think it came out a year after Head of the Family. Yeah. 97. 97 was the yep. year, I think, so. Yeah, I but... Uh, that's not taking anything away from the movie. This movie is a no. ton of fun to watch. It is a blast. There's actual, like, the, the human characters are super fun to watch. Yeah. Probably more fun to watch than the hideous, like, monsters, right? Yeah. like Because they're all is... super eccentric and weird and all have a very distinct character type. Yeah. And they all have different goals of being in this house. Yeah. And, like, watching. It's, it's almost like an Agatha Christie, like, it's got, like, an Agatha Christie cast of characters all with ulterior motives type yep. of vibe to it and it's something i wasn't expecting from a full moon because it's like way more talky than most full moon pictures like yeah. most of it is just characters talking but what's happening is like it's fun it's fun to watch the characters it doesn't it doesn't go like full off the rails zany the way that head of the family does but at the same time the characters make it work on a different level than what yeah. that movie does, you know. There, there's a sword fight. There's yeah. <laughs> hidden, there's like a hidden trap door that falls into a pit of like acid. Like yeah. this movie's bonkers. It's insane. Definitely check out Hideous. There's quicksand that for some reason like never seems to come back up again. Oh, that's right. There's like there they make a whole big deal of like. There's a very Jacqueline weird level hopping over the quicksand. Yeah. That's but right. then I feel like they never go, they don't go back to that, do they? I don't think so. 
I, I can't remember them actually. I kept thinking like, oh, someone's gonna get messed up in the quicksand. And then there's I also feel a like very very eccentric uh uh I don't even know what his job title would be. He's like the the foreman of this this plant that this <laughs> this waste management plant that is super weird and it's like, yeah, I find all kinds of things when I dig them out of yeah. the people's crap. I'm like, what? Why? Yeah. You're weird. And he's like, he's got like deals with these like, th- these like oddity brokers where he's Multi- like, hey, billionaire I found, brokers, yeah. I, I found a bundle of organs in the sewage today. You want it? <laughs> <laughs> the covenant crap. You want to buy it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. It's a wild movie. It is it's a so wild much movie. fun. Recommends from both of us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sam, I'm gonna use this as our maybe our transition into what you're to be doing. Yeah. So obviously I've been kind of on a full moon bender recently too. You're welcome. Um, I, uh, I watched the first two subspecies movies on Casey's recommendation. And because the new one hit screen box and all five of them were on screen box. I'm like, I might as well just go through these this summer. Um, did not realize until very recently that subspecies was a vampire series. Um, And that got me really excited for him. Mm -hmm. And it does not disappoint. Like it's definitely got vibes of, you know, it follows the template kind of, of Dracula, Nosferatu, those Mm -hmm. kinds of things. The first one anyways, but it also adds so much to it in terms of like, how they deal with vampires. I mean, they put rosary beads and a shotgun in this movie in the first one. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. Um, Radu is always drooling blood. He looks like the crow had sex with Nosferatu and is their unholy spawn. Mm -hmm. It's kind of (laughs) great. His voice, his voice is so incredible. It's like, yeah, very raspy and kind of mesmerizing in a way. Yes. Yes. And so I really liked the first subspecies, but it was, I mean, I think you even said this in your review on Letterboxd, like pacing is a little wonky in this. In the first one. Yep. Yeah. In the first one, it's, it's just, there are moments where you're kind of lulling and you're like, "Ah, I wish that they would move on to the next thing already. The first subspecies is is a get to Radu movie. Yes. Yes. Whereas I don't know what your thoughts on, on subspecies too. I like subspecies too a lot. So I didn't like totally knock my socks off, Okay, but I really liked it. I liked it a lot better than the first subspecies. Um, and part of that too, like, so it was a Sunday afternoon. I was very sleepy. I laid down on the couch with Boris. I fell asleep halfway through it and went back to it and like watched the second half later. So that might've like, you know, whenever you mm-hmm. watch it in pieces, sometimes that like diminishes it a little bit. So I do want to go back and watch it like straight through sometime soon because this movie's insane. Um, the mother kid, what do they call her? It's not mother. Uh, mummy. Mummy. Yeah. Oh, she's so gnarly. <laughs> Incredible and and special effects on her. Oh, yeah. It's so cool. Like I, as soon as her character was introduced in this movie, I was like hooked in. I'm like, yes. Like, ah, uh, you know, because they, they mentioned in the first one the evil sorceress that's Radu's mother and everything. I never thought we were actually going to get the evil sorceress, though. And in two, we do. And yeah. she's she's so creepy. She's got a great, um, I mean, the final scene with her is just a great kind of cliffhanger ending that's followed by an immediate title card that's <laughs> subspecies three coming soon. I love that. Mm-hmm. Charlie Band just always looking forward to selling you the next thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, subspecies two rules. Uh, it it reminded me a little bit, like about halfway through the movie, I'm like, this is kind of following the same plot beats as like Psycho, if Marion Crane had been turned into a vampire instead of just murdered. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. It, it's kind of cool in that aspect. Uh, yeah, I really liked. I really liked these subspecies movies. Um, looking forward to watching three and four, and then five, which I know. You're all you're gonna talk about all three of those. So yes, I am. I'm gonna be talking about well, I'm gonna talk about all three. Uh three, four, and five. Yes. 
Uh, I will say, just to touch on, so part two ends, like you said, with a cliffhanger. It's picked up immediately in part three in uh, Subspecies Bloodlust, part three. It is, so two and three were shot at the same time. They shot them all together. Okay. They knew they knew they were going to make them. The, it's all part of one big story, for sure. And those, well, all the movies are connected, but especially two and three are very intertwined. Okay. Um, yes, so, uh, Subspecies 3, I don't think it's as good as 2. It kind of hits many of the same beats as the second one. And it's like, mm. we've kind of already done that. But it's it's always nice to... What I found is I like to hang out with the human characters a lot. Yeah. Like, Michelle is a great character. She's a great, like, I guess you wouldn't necessarily call her the final girl, but she's a great central character for this yes. series. Yeah. Yep. And her sister, uh, Becca, Rebecca, mm -hmm. is is a great like protagonist, kind of leading the story. Uh, Kevin Spiritus, who's in uh, Friday the 13th Part 7, he's in The Hills Have Eyes, um, kind of a scream king in his own right, I think. We can definitely throw him in there. Yeah. He's in he's in the uh two and three as like the like US embassy. He's like he works yeah. for the US Embassy. Yeah, yeah. He definitely becomes a love interest in part three. Well, you kind of More, saw that happening in yeah. part two. Like you, you knew where that was going. Yep, yeah. and it finally finally happens in part three. It's a ton of fun. I think it's a it's a great send off for the series if if they had ended in part three. Okay. But there is subspecies four, which came out. So subspecies three was ninety four, which was I think the same. No, the next uh, the year after part two. Yeah. Then they had a four year break, but it okay. also picks up right after the events of part three. Unfortunately, like you said, with hideous, you can kind of see the the budget is starting to, yeah, to, to to whimper a bit in you, those late nineties entries. Yeah, and you yeah. definitely see it here. This was ninety eight for subspecies four. It's not a bad movie. It just doesn't. It's it's not as good as the first three. Okay. And it's okay. a bit of a letdown, especially after two and three. It's a good. It's still a good movie. It's just not great. I think it's on par with the first movie. Okay. But it definitely I mean, has that late '90s full moon vibe of like this is definitely low budget. Unfortunately, Michelle is kind of in like a hospital the entire. Oh uh, yeah, and they pull like, Jamie Lee. Yeah, and it's like no, I like I like her as a as a protagonist that's moving the plot forward more than Radu is coming to get her. Yeah. And there's also something they do with her with with Rebecca and Mel that I don't love. I won't spoil it for you. I don't love where they go with those characters. Okay. But so so sub, this is all leading up to subspecies 5, which is the reason I started watching it because I knew the new subspecies was was coming out. Uh subspecies 5 Bloodlust just dropped on Screenbox. It's on Full Moon. It's on their Amazon channel as well. It just did like a Alamo Draft House release, like an actual like Full Moon is pushing this movie pretty hard, which is good. That's pretty cool. This, I don't know if you've watched the trailer yet. I haven't because okay. I didn't want anything to spoil. I didn't want to spoil anything, but I do know it's a prequel. It is a prequel. It's set in like the 1500s, I think. Oh, that's dope. This one is shot. the The first four were all shot in Romania. This one was shot in, not in Romania. I don't remember. It's another, okay. Euro, a, a different European country. Um, but the production value that you see in two and three, especially, is present here. Yeah, and that's so nice to see. It's shot on location. Again, it is a low budget movie because it is a full moon movie. But compared to other full moon movies of present day, like Sam, you watched Sorority Babes too, for example. You can clearly oh, yeah. tell that was a very low budget shot within like a week. Only like had a certain on a, amount of time. On a DSLR camera. <laughs> like yeah. yeah. This one it's it's incredible. They had I think they had two weeks to shoot or something. Two or three weeks. I think there was three weeks to shoot, which okay. like full moon standards nowadays, that's like <laughs> that's three movies for for, for Charlie. I yeah. watched I watched this on the Full Moon app which includes a like a 25 minute interview with Charlie and Ted Nicolau the director that's and cool it's kind of like a mini version of Charlie's podcast the full moon freak show which i love that show it's nice to have it is basically a mini version of that where they talk about the making of part 5 so if you are looking for a little bit more of the behind the scenes bit of 
these movies. Definitely recommend that. This movie is the origin story of Radu, and it's not what you expect. Okay. So they do bring back... Everybody comes back, pretty much, of the main core characters. Uh, core actors, let's say that. Okay. Uh, Denise Duff, who plays Michelle, comes back. Do they but, pull, like, a Fear Street where, in, like, 1966? She's, yes. okay. she's the villain seducing Radu this time. What? And she's incredible in this movie. Kevin Spiritus is in the movie. As a completely, he's obviously not this U.S. Embassy character. Yeah. In the 1500s, he gets to play a vampire this time, too. That's cool. In some incredible makeup. Again, what I love about these movies most, about the subspecies movies, is the vibe that they have. Shooting on location, in castles, using using shadow work, using the... Some would call it cheesy special effects, where it has the transition like from the shadow to the actual actor. Mm-hmm. which I love. They bring that back in part five, and it's like, oh, nice. I love that you're doing this stuff in camera. It's incredible. Uh, this is all basically lit by fire, lit with torches, lit with like fires that the characters sitting around, fires hanging up in the castle. It's incredible. You're going to love this movie. I think this is... I hope horror fans go out and make make way for this. Even if you haven't watched any subspecies movie before, you can jump right into this. Because it is a prequel, you're not going to miss anything. Obviously, it's going to help if you see the if you've seen the other movies, but you don't need to. I would say this is this is Full Moon's best series by far. That's and awesome. It is, it is one that keeps quality throughout. It is one to seek out. I hope horror fans seek out Subspecies Five. Yeah, that's cool. I'm really excited to watch this one, especially now. Um, yeah, like I said, I love I. I, I really like the first two. Um, I definitely feel like, from what you've told me about three, that one will be up my alley, too. Yeah. And uh, especially five. I, I'm a sucker for, like, that old, like, old school castle horror. Yep. Um, I think I even, I, I texted you that. I'm like, I just want to watch, like, the full moon movies that are set in a castle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're, they're my favorite types. I love all that. So. And this is the one that started, Subspecies is the one that started all. Charlie talks about Ted Nicolau, the, the writer and director of all these movies, really the creative force behind Subspecies. Yep. He calls him Agent Nicolau because <laughs> he's the first person he sent to Romania after like they had like a, a war in Romania. And a year oh. later, a year later, Charlie sends Ted over there to scout everything out. Then we get the Romanian movies that they made, and Subspecies was, I believe, the first one. That's awesome. That's really cool. Anyway, Sam, what else are you do be doing besides uh, me me throwing my full moon in influence at you? I am okay. So I'm gonna start with a bit of a bummer. Um, the Yellow Jacket season two finale happens, and I'm not quite over it yet. Um. I want to preface this by saying I still love this show unequivocally. Yeah. I will be there right away. Season three. Like I'm very excited to see where they go with this. Um, the cast is incredible. I think on a writing level, the yellow jacket season two finale is like a very rare misstep in this show. Um, there are standout moments. There are standout performances. Christina Ricci and Juliette Lewis in particular are incredible in this last episode. I do not like the arc that they... Not even an arc. There is a character moment in this that feels like it is... It cuts a character arc short in order mm. to inform another character arc. Instead of letting that, it, it just, it feels like they sacrificed one character arc for a couple of different ones. And unfortunately, it was a character that I very much appreciated and enjoyed and is one of like the standout characters to me. And I did not like the way that the end of this character's arc was written um, without getting into spoilers. I just... There's still a lot to love in this show, but I find that the present day storyline, especially this season, was a little more convoluted and messy and wandering. And I'm more, 
for I don't know how to put this. In the first season, I was equally excited for both the present day and the 1996 plane crash mm-hmm. timelines. Like it didn't matter which one we were in. I was like, I was all on board. Season two, as it went on, I found myself missing the 1996 wilderness when we weren't there. Mm. I just feel like the older, like the older cast and the arcs that they have been given in this second season just were kind of messy. I feel like they dropped characters out of the middle half of the season just to bring them back for like weird rushed endings at the end. And I think that's what it was. Like, I feel like in the present day timeline, the last two episodes felt really rushed felt like characters were making decisions where it's like, why is that where we're hopping to right away here? Like this feels like it could have been built up over a couple of episodes. That said, whew, this cast is incredible. I, I can't wait for season three. I'm very excited to see where it goes. The uh, 96 timeline ends on a cliffhanger that makes me very much like shit. Yeah. Like let's like, let's go. This is cool. Um, but yeah, I, I was just I was a little disappointed in the Yellow Jackets season two finale. Hopefully with I don't know, hopefully with season three we get back to what I loved about the uh, adult timeline, I guess. So yeah, there's Yellow Jackets, still a high recommendation from me. Just temper your expectations going into the end of season okay. two a little bit. Um I finally got to sit down and watch Curtis Davis. Uh, Curtis David Harder's influencer on Shudder. We interviewed him uh, ahead of the release of that. Uh, this movie rules. It is a really cool social media thriller that, um, God, without spoiling it, the title sequence doesn't happen until 26 minutes into the movie. And from there, you're like, oh shit, where is this going? Yep. And it's. I love it's, those. I love when uh, movies like wait. Until, like, the first act is done and then drop the title card. Yeah, and that's what it is. Like, this whole, like, and the first act, you're kind of like, yeah, okay, this is all pretty typical, like, setup, pot boiler thriller. Like, you know, this, you know, you know, something's off with this relationship and all that. And then, like, the credits drop and you're just like, oh, shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Doesn't, does Barbarian do that? Actually, I think it does. Yep. I think it does. Might be one of the few things that really worked for me in Barbarian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. So, yeah. Influencer. It, it's gorgeously shot. All the, like, Thailand locations are incredible. I love um, th- movie shot in Thailand, man. Yeah. Oh, dude. This movie. I'll, be, is- I'll, I'll, I'll have this watch by the time we, we do our next episode. Uh, we just got a new TV and, like, it doesn't have shutter. Oh. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, so highly recommend Influencer. It's really cool. Um, it's streaming on Shutter now. Uh, Cassandra Nod in the central performance is just electric. She's so good. Um, check out our interview with Curtis, too. Yeah, and check out our interview with Curtis because he kind of talks about the making of that and the happy accidents that led to them being able to shoot in Thailand. And um, yeah, it's a, it's it's a fun movie. Like it's It's a thriller like they don't make anymore. It reminds me... It's not, there's not like sex or anything in it, but it reminds me, it gives me the vibes of like a nineties erotic thriller at times, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, Oh God, what do I, what do I want to talk about next? I got two more movies that I I get to talk about and both of them just have I seen either of these bangers, dude. Uh, You've seen one of them. So I'll start with the one that you haven't seen. I'll start with phantasm two. Um, back when we did slash lot, we did a blind spot episode yep. and both of us decided to watch phantasm because neither of us had done it. And like Blake really likes that movie. Um, and I know I like phantasm a little bit more than you did. Yeah. Um, I just think the tall man is incredible. I think the, uh, the sentinels, the spears are great. I mean, I mm-hmm. have a, I have one yeah. on my shelf. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I finally watched Phantasm 2, cracked open my box set that I got, and uh, oh my god, dude, it, I, it, I think it's better than the first. Uh, it really leans into the, uh, the schlock. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have the like as much of a dreamlike eerie quality as the first one does, um, but it still kind of follows the dream logic. Like it's a wild movie where you're just kind of like, yeah, I'm just going to go with this. Some of this isn't making sense, like, <laughs> but the, like, but 
if you just like go along for the ride, there are some insane gore effects. The third act of this is just like a, a, a mirage of gore and the Sentinels doing crazy shit. I'm talking like a, they don't just like they don't do the drill into the head and spurt blood. Like you get that, but they do so much more. <laughs> it's like some of these things. I'm like, how did they even do that? Like, geez, it's it's great. Um, they like worm their way into people and eat their way back out of them. It's it's nasty, okay, dude. It's okay. it's cool. Uh, so yeah, Phantasm two. Um, I I gave it four and a half stars, and I have a feeling that on rewatches this might turn into a five star. Like it worked for me. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm excited really to watch these. I've heard the sequels like really ramp up the the overall concept, which I didn't. Yeah. I liked the concept of it. I liked the tall man. I didn't love like the movie, like the yeah. overall movie, I guess. But I've heard this the sequels are great. I I need to get back to the series. Dude, I think you'll dig Phantasm too. Like it's it's still got the budget. Sam um, did a Angus 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 Scrim double feature, I think. I did. I did. Because he's in the he's in the he's first, in the first sub- subspecies. Subspecies, yeah. 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 Uh in a in like a Beethoven wig. He looks like vampire Beethoven. It's great. <laughs> he does. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Phantasm 2 rules. Um, I'm probably going to watch three at some point this week and keep going with those. I'm just going to alternate between Phantasm and subspecies movies, I think. You know what I love is that on our on our show, on Screams from the Basement, you can kind of see yeah. our progression through series. It's kind of fun. Like yeah. It is. I feel like I will probably jump on the Phantasm train as soon as you finish it, and we'll be talking yep. about it again. I don't know. It's fun to to hear our thoughts as we're going through series that we've never seen before. It is, yeah. And I think it's fun to like see what recommendations we pick up from each other, because yeah. I feel like we've been doing that a lot, where it's like, oh, hey, you watched this like two episodes ago, but I just watched this, and it mm-hmm. rules. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Phantasm 2, big recommendation from me. Um, And then the final movie that I want to talk about. This is, I think I did give this five stars. Wow. I watched Frank Henenlotter's Brain Damage. And I did not think I'd be saying this when I hit play on Frank Henenlotter's Brain Damage. But it's my favorite Frank Henenlotter movie so far. Oh, okay. By by like a mile. And I just. Even more than Frankenhooker. Even more than Frankenhooker, dude. Like, I loved Brain Damage. This movie is insane. It's about a guy who gets like drugged up by a turd penis monster. And it's like a weird metaphor for addiction that like lands with complete authenticity, but it's also just. B movie schlock. Yeah. There's a blowjob scene in this that is harrowing. It's like the grossest and most disturbing thing I've seen. And yet it's also like really funny in a sick way. I don't know. Like this movie made me feel a lot of conflicting emotions at multiple times. And I love that about it. Like it just, I don't know. It goes for the throat. It's got some great visual gags um the monster is very phallic in multiple points yes i i'm pretty sure i even like i re- I, I rewound and re-recorded on my phone one of my favorite visual gags just to send to you and blake on our chat because i was like this is cinema <laughs> like oh uh, it's so good uh brain damage rules the final shot is so cool like i don't know how they pulled it off I would love to uh, get the like big Blu-ray for the director's commentary. Sorry, my cats are fighting. Get stop fighting. Knock it off. <laughs> let them let them fight. <laughs> um, yeah. So brain damage just it, it rules. I really want to get the um, the boutique label Blu-ray. I can't remember which which label put it out, but I am one hundred percent going to get brain damage on Blu-ray. Because I'm pretty sure there's a commentary, and I want to hear all of Frank Henenlotter's thoughts on this. Because, damn, dude, like this movie was just—it was insane. I I loved it. Every every bit of it wouldn't change a damn thing. I think it's perfect. 
it made me uncomfortable though. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> it's not going to be for everybody, but yeah. like I, I it, no Frank Henenlotter is for everyone. Yeah, that's that's fair. That's yeah. fair. I'm like I'm up in the air on whether I want to show this one to Maria because I'm like, ah, oh, she might not appreciate, especially like the the the, the blowjob scene. Like I'm like she might not appreciate that. I don't mm. know. It's because it is. It's pretty. It it's for lack of a better term, it's pretty fucked up. Like, yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's, I don't know. It's an insane movie. Um, I can't believe Hen and Lauder put some of the things to film that he actually did. Did you just hear Boris? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're going nuts. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was what I've been watching. Um, so yeah, everybody like go watch brain damage too. I'm, I'm recommending pretty much everything. Like everything I watched, I had, I had a good couple of weeks, man. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Is that it for Doobie Doing? Is that all That's we've it. been Doobie or That's, Doobie Done? That's all I've been Doobie Doing aside from watching a lot of Kelly Maroney movies. And that is our main topic for this episode. Kelly Maroney movies. We're talking about one of the, the greatest scream queens, one of the greatest horror icons of all mm-hmm. time. The star of such movies as Chopping Well, Night of the Comet, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, The Zero Boy, Scare Package 2, Sorority Babes in the Slimeball, Bolorama 2, Hell and yeah. many more movies. Sam, um, again, the reason we're doing this, if you're just tuning in, I don't think that's how that works. I've heard other podcasters say that if you're just tuning in, but we're an hour into this episode. I don't know why you're just scr- scrubbing till, till an hour yeah. and six minutes into the episode, but if you are. We're All talking, of our words are gold. Listen to the whole thing. Go back. Rewind. <laughs> no, the reason we're talking about Kelly Maroney movies is because she's going to be one of our featured uh, guests at Supercon this year in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, happening September 29th through October 1st at the Sioux Falls Convention Center and Arena. We are going to be showing at least one, like we said, Kelly Maroney movie. But we're going to be talking about pretty much all of them right here, right now. What was your first introduction to kelly murrow so probably like i assume i think i would know i think i know which one it is it's because i know you kind of grew up with one of the movies yeah so it's fast times Mm -hmm. but that was before i knew who like that was before i knew kelly maroney you know what i mean so like i always thought she was really funny in it like she's She's not a huge character in it, but she's the cheerleader that like pops like the up funny, here and there. Perky cheerleader, yeah, yeah, and the one who has like the kind of mental breakdown at the pep rally that's mm-hmm. really funny. Like, um, yeah, she's got a couple of really gold scenes in there, and you know, uh, but yeah, I, I just I didn't know who that was until like I think Chopping Mall was when I was like, holy shit, mm-hmm. who is this? And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember her from, like, Fast Times and all that kind of, you know. Um, because, yeah, Chopping Mall was the – Chopping Mall was my pandemic movie, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, I watched that at the start of 2020, and it was just, like – it was my comfort food. I mean, it's been my comfort food for the last, like, three years now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. What about you? What was your first – because I know you just watched Fast Times for the first time. I just watched Fast Times for the first time ever for this. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow. I don't know how I went 28 years of my life without having seen this movie because I grew up on those like 80s teen movies. Yeah. Like and this Ferris is like, Bueller, I mean, this is Breakfast Club. And yeah. Our, yeah. St- stuff I grew up on. But uh, we'll talk about that one. But. Chopping Mall was mine. I think I watched this when I first got Shutter in like 2019. Okay. Yeah. And I vividly remember the first time I watched it, I immediately watched it again like the next day. And then mm-hmm. like a week later I watched it again. Like it was I watched this movie like 3 times in the first month of having seen it for the first time. Yep. I think you did the same. I don't know what it is about the movie, about Chopping Mall. So that has that quality of like I just want to rewatch this movie. It's just, it never stops being entertaining for the entire like 80 minutes. Yeah. Like, it's, it's one of those movies. I, I literally like, I think it's a perfect B movie because it, it never tries to be anything more than what it is, but it does what 
it's supposed to do really well. Yeah, it does the concept of like, okay, the concept is if you haven't seen Chopping Mall, I don't know what you people are doing. but What are you yeah. doing listening to the show? Go yeah. watch Chopping Mall. Like we've told you pretty much every episode. Every episode. It's the Chopping Mall <laughs> podcast, basically. Uh, it's a So Jim Wynorski directed Chopping Mall, which was uh, originally titled Killbots. Yep, and that and it, flopped. It, and it delivers that both titles i think perfectly of the premise that you get of these these robots that are supposed to be taking over mall security that get corrupted and start <laughs> by killing lightning off, by lightning for no reason and start killing off teenagers yeah like that's the movie that's, that's it. it there's nothing else to this movie no and but it does it, that to perfection it does and the teens are just so the teens are essentially stock characters but they add enough quirks, yeah. whether it be through the writing or the performances, to where, like, they don't feel like stock characters. They mm -hmm. genuinely feel like a group of friends that would be hanging out. Yeah. The teens and Dick, uh, Dick Miller. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, and you can't forget... Um, uh, I forget his name, but he's the, he's the uh, adoptive dad in Child's Play 2. He's the security guard that gets necked. Oh, really? Yeah. What? Yeah. He's the stepdad in, uh, or the the adoptive father, or the foster parent in um, okay. Child's Play too. Yep, the one that's reading like the the dirty magazine, and the the killbot keeps yeah. like inching forward behind him. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. He. I think what it does, yeah, like you said, what it does, what Chopping Mall does so well is setting up characters that you know the archetypes of them. Yeah. And they're but they're always a ton of fun to watch. A lot of it comes out of the performances too. Yeah, because you have the I don't even remember the guy's name. He's the guy chewing the gum the entire time. Isn't it like Mike or something like Maybe. that? Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like you know that guy just from like him chewing gum. You know who that character is, and it's so funny. He is maybe <laughs> maybe besides Allison, he might be my favorite character in the movie. Isn't he the one that says like "fuck the fuchsia"? It's Friday. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. That's the that's the that's, that's the, the other guy. That's, that's the Barbara other guy. Hampton's boyfriend. Yes, right? that, yeah, that yeah, likes yeah. pepperoni. Yes, <laughs> I like pepperoni. You smell like pepperoni. I like pepperoni. Yeah. There's so many like, great lines in this movie too. And Mike's whole scene with the killbot before his death, where he's like, he's like not even worried at all, just flashing his ID yeah. card shirtless in the mall with like his pants half undone. And he's just like, hey, buddy, like <laughs> trying to I buy a here. pack of cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> Still chewing gum. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Like obnoxiously chewing gum. He is he has very to let obnoxious. You, he has to let you know he's chewing gum. Yep. And it's that same piece of gum that entire day he's had at the mall. Oh yeah, 100%. he showed up at the mall at 11 a.m. to work at the furniture store. He's and a, kept he's, that same gum. He's a real Violet Beauregard, that one. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and obviously, the central performance of it all is Kelly Maroney as Allison, mm -hmm. Allison Parks, who I found out from watching. I watched the Joe Bob presentation of mm -hmm. this before this podcast. I found out that was because um, that was an actual name of a of a nude model that uh, Jim Wynorski had a crush on. <laughs> of course like, it is. Of course okay, it is. Okay, yep, that makes yeah. sense. Yep. And yeah, uh, Kelly Maroney in this, it, like, I remember when we did our kill count, or our kill count, is that what we called them? Kill count? Killer countdown. Yes. That's right. Killer countdown. We're when not we dead meat, final Sam. girl We're not ones. dead meat. Yeah. Getting my horror shows mixed up, even my own ones. Um, <laughs> Speaking of dead meat, he uses a line from this movie. Yeah. In his, the, like, intro. Yeah. Yep. The Dick Miller, if I ever catch the people, the bastards. The little this, bastards that did this. The dead, the dead, dead meat. meat. <laughs> he's so funny in this movie. God. He is. Dick he's Miller's great in Gremlins too. Another okay. reason for you to watch Gremlins too. Another reason Spoilers, for you to watch he Gremlins didn't. He didn't too. die in the first Gremlins. <laughs> um, I, yeah, so I just, I don't know. I love Kelly Maroney's performance. When we did the Killer Countdown, we did Final Girls. And the one thing that I wish I would have actually had the guts to do on that list is to put Allison from Chopping Mall on it. Yeah. Because to me, like, she's the quintessential, like, 80s final girl. I, like, she's so good. She's, like, she plays the, like, the innocent, 
oh, I don't really, I'm not really into boys. I don't know what I'm doing so well. But then when shit hits the fan, all of a sudden she's just like cocking guns and she's like, my dad's a Marine. And mm -hmm. I'm just like, mm, like everything about this performance is so good. And she's just, she's tremendous. Uh, yeah. I, like, I, I love her performance in this. It's one of my favorite in any horror movies. Mm -hmm. She brings this, this, this charm where you see this in a lot of final girls, especially is that they're playing the the archetype of the final girl. They're, they're the virgin or the nerdy girl or, yeah, you know, they're the, the timid one that ends up with the nerdy guy, which happens in this movie, mm -hmm. but there's something else there whenever Kelly plays it where she, well, she definitely has that, but it's like, she's not a bland blank slate of a character though. Yeah. She always like, has a charm to it. She finishes her drink and she tosses it over her shoulder, makes the basket, and then just like goes in for the kiss. Yeah. Like it's like she's she's assertive, she knows what she wants, and you know, she didn't want to be at the party at first, and then she starts having a good time, yeah. and then everybody starts she's having watching a real black, bad time. Black and white monster movies. That's what you and I would do at a party. Yeah, one hundred percent. I was always the guy that was like sitting in front of the tv with like some crappy movie on going like yep. what why are you guys making out <laughs> aren't you, you are you seeing this <laughs> like dude psycho's on what are you guys doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um and she has a, a great you know the the great line at the end have a nice day yeah you know taking the killbots line that they they set up right at the beginning of the movie putting it yep. against them having them explode this movie rules. So, Kelly on the on the Joe Bob she on on Joe Bob's uh, last drive-in, she was talking about how she has a in her in her head. All three of the Killbots have different personalities. Like the one on the first floor, the one that blows up uh, Susie Slater's head. Yeah, he's the uh, he's like the militant. Like he's the military one. You know, he knows what he's doing, and he's he's the hard ass. The one on second floor, she says, is the goofball that kind of is just, you know, whirring around, being being goofy until he, you know, finally croaks. And then she said the, the Killbot 3 was Dirty Harry. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, all mm -hmm. right. That makes sense. Like, when you watch the movie, it's like, yeah, that's, they do, like, all three Killbots actually do kind of have different personalities, in a sense. Mm hmm just an interesting i just i'd never picked up on that until i watched the joe bob uh the joe bob episode and i was like god this is and i think that's the the gift of chopping mall is it's it's not a very deep movie there's no like meaning of life behind it but it's so packed with entertainment value mm -hmm. that you find something new to appreciate about it every single time you watch it or at least i do yeah. And I've watched it a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is my go-to movie. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. Last thing I have to say is the uh, the, the 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 slob that's eating at the pizza place. It's <laughs> one of my favorite cinematic lines ever that just cuts to the next scene right after. It's just him, like, just covered in pizza sauce, like, all over his face and his shirt. Just, Waitress, more butter. <laughs> it's so funny. I don't know what it is. And I think he's even like wiping his hand, greasy hands on his shirt when he yeah. says it. I'm like, oh god. He's like, no, he's shoving food yeah. into his face, and he yells it. Yeah, yeah like, wipe like, more butter. butter. <laughs> he's like eating pizza too. I'm like, what the hell are you? What? What are you putting butter on pizza for? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that movie. Yeah, chopping one of the greatest Marvel. of all time. Uh, next one I I'll, I'll throw out there as we, I'll use it as our transition into the Kelly Maroney cheerleader universe. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about, we'll, we'll, we'll do both of them. Yeah. Fast times at Richmond high and night of the Comet, both of which I wouldn't, I won't put either under horror night of the Comet, obviously more. You don't that's think more of just sci-fi. Yeah. That's fair. It, more it, than anything. It plays to me a little bit like a, uh, like an 80s update of a 50s classic. Yeah. Like Night of the Comet almost feels like it should be a remake of some like 50s atomic horror movie. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
which is probably why I love that movie so much. Too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's definitely something that that's a, that's a Sam lens classic right there. Oh, it's like yeah. the fifties aesthetic, but in the eighties. Yeah. It's like, that's, that's my whole thing. I mean, it's why night of the creeps continues to be like the blob. Absolute the blob. Exactly. Like, ah, uh, I love those. Even like Cronenberg's the fly. I know that one doesn't have a lot of like, that doesn't have a lot of fifties vibes, no. in it, but it's a remake of a fifties yeah. movie. So it's like kind of the same. Um, no, night of the Comet's great because it's the only, uh, it's the only movie that you get Kelly Maroney and Catherine Marie Stewart shopping in a mall to uh, girls just want to have fun. That also gets interrupted by a bloody standoff with a bunch of half mutants. Mm-hmm. Like it's great. The, uh, <laughs> the mall sequence in, in, night of the comet is to me it's the centerpiece of the movie like it's the it's the point that i was like no this movie fucking rules like yeah it's my favorite part of the movie and the 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 line delivery of like they they've got one of the guys hostage and he's you know the the leader of the gang ma'am i can't have you holding one of my men hostage and then he just shoots him (laughs) And they're like, oh, my God, are you crazy? He goes, I'm not crazy. I just don't give a fuck. And it's just one of the best line deliveries that I've seen. And, like, it's up there with waitress more butt. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, it's so good. It's so good. And you've got the douchey. Uh, okay, so I'm going to get, like, super nerdy deep pull here. Um, you get the the douchey guy at the end in the car that picks up yeah. Kelly Maroney. That's uh that's one of the, uh, that's one of the uh, sidekick jocks to Dennis in uh, John Carpenter's Christine. He's okay. the one that he's the one that goes, be careful. You're tip the table over. And he like lifts the table up in study hall. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. He's great. And he's really funny in his like 30 second cameo at the end of this movie. <laughs> Like the the final lines being like Kelly Maroney going, yeah, guess it's on us or guess the burden of society is on us now. And he just goes, yeah, bitching, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Is this the same mall as Chopping Mall? I, I think so. I think they shot this part like in, or maybe not. I don't know. I don't, I have no idea. It's the same. It's still LA, right? yeah. Yeah. The mall, yeah. the mall, the chopping mall mall is the same one from Fast Times too. Yep, and from uh, and from Phantom of the Mall, and from like a ton of other like, yeah. Joe Bob actually listed off a bunch that I didn't even know when uh, they were when they were doing doing chopping mall, and I can't remember all is, of them, but he had a list of almost like is I Commando. Swear, I think Commando was one of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's there's a ton of movies that uh. Because it's like it's Sherman Oaks, right? Yep. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I love Night of the Comet. I know this is one that you like but don't love. Yeah. I like, don't love. I need to rewatch this. I've only seen it the one time under your recommendation. And I might have overhyped it because, like I said, this is a very me movie. (laughs) Yeah. I just need to get, I think I just need to rewatch it because it's not exactly what I was expecting, I don't think. Yeah. Like again, the, the the scene we talked about where it's the girls by themselves in the mall is my favorite part. And I'm like, I could just watch like 80, 90 minutes of just that. Yep. I think it's the I, best part. And I love Kelly getting behind the DJ booth at the at the abandoned radio station and playing songs for all the mm-hmm. teenage <laughs> the teenage comet zombies out there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, uh, I have the comment I like. I like. I need to re- rewatch this movie. I will probably watch it before Supercon for sure. Just to oh, yeah. have it fresh. But the the one I want to talk about is just because I recently watched it and it's fresh in my mind. And again, I had never seen it before. Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Again, yeah, not a horror movie at all. Teen sex comedy drama too. Uh, I didn't. Again, I didn't love this movie. I and, like. Go ahead. Uh, so I just rewatched this today just to have it fresh in my mind mm-hmm. because I know you like I hadn't watched it in a few years. Um, and like I said, I, I like grew up on this one. I really like this one. Um, and OK, I have to admit, 
some of it does not hold up as well yep. as like it, it's not a dazed and confused. I think I used to put it up there with dazed and confused. Dazed and, and confused think, is truly timeless. Yes, this one is not. This no. one has a few things where like you've got beloved characters making like homophobic jokes and things like that that kind of like not that that stuff you can still enjoy movies when that's happening, mm-hmm. but like sometimes it, it it's just like it takes me out a little bit. Um, like you said, some of the uh, creepier, more like for lack of a better term, rapey elements are. I don't know. I think they're handled with with compassion, but like they're also a little bit uncomfortable. Ooh, I don't know if they're handled like. Okay, we'll talk about. It. Maybe uh, not. I don't know. <laughs> so, Ke- Kelly Maroney is the first person you see in this movie, which yeah. I was super surprised by. She plays Cindy, the like head cheerleader. Yep. Super funny in this movie is. I mean, she's she's seen throughout. Usually making out with some guy. <laughs> yeah, making out with some guy or making like a comment about her being a cheerleader and like someone like she's like painting one of the signs in the hallway and someone like kicks over her paint. <laughs> she has a great reaction to that. Yep. Yep. She's like, she's the cheerleader that just keeps getting dumped on and you kind of feel bad for her, but she's also so funny in the role. <laughs> she reminds me of, I don't remember the, the name of the girl, but she's in Greece where she's like the main chair. The, there's the main cheerleader in Greece. Oh yeah. Patty, Patty talking. Simpkins, I think is her name. I yeah, think that's the I character's think so. name. She reminds me of her in Greece. Yeah. Like that same type of character. She's super funny in this movie, though. I could see that. I could see that. Um, okay, like I said, I, I watched this for the first time. Again, it's not a horror movie. We're gonna talk about it though. This is our it's our podcast, and we can talk about whatever we want. The stuff with the main character, Stacy, Jennifer Jason Lee's character, is icky. Yes. Very icky. Yeah. She she like starts the movie with Phoebe Cates and they're talking about boys, obviously, because they're in high school. Mm-hmm. It is said right away that she's only 15 years old. Yep. And then she's hitting on a dude at the mall who's 26. I think, I think he says 26. Yeah. 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 He's 11 she, years old in there. And she lies and tells him she's 19. Yep. Which that's. And, and they, they do it in a baseball dugout. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't think that scene is played as romantic the way you do. Like, I know that the needle the music, drop is romantic. The music cue is very romantic. But, like, the way it's performed is very much like she's, like, I don't know. I feel like she's uncomfortable with it. Mm, I don't. No? No. Mm, maybe not. I don't know. It doesn't I, get any better with Damone, who yeah. is the worst. I hate him. <laughs> Punch him in the face right now. Yes, he he's the worst character in the movie. I hate but he's him so played much. so well. Like the he, actor who's performing him, like created a character, and it's a believable character. Like I knew people like that oh, in high school. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And he is a 37 year old playing a 17 year old, <laughs> which is the best kind. I love that. <laughs> like even Judge Reinhold. Like I, I don't think he was that old when he was. Judge Maybe Reinhold, this. I can I, I believe in, like, in, 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 in high school. Still, oh, he still looks old. As he shit, looks dude. old. He, they all look old. <laughs> like the, when the girls Arnold's are the only ones that him. look like care that look like high schooler. Yeah, and not except for Phoebe Cates. Phoebe Cates does not look like a high schooler. I don't think. I think she does. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously, and then you get the the Phoebe Cates scene with her and. Judge Reinhold, like yep, the uh, I've, I've obviously seen that scene before. Yeah, it's and buried it's, in so many different things, and I love the like, I love the little bit of trivia that like video stores were having issues because tapes were wearing thin on that part because people <laughs> kept pausing yeah. and like rewinding it over, and I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Yep. <laughs> What I didn't realize, I thought that was like, I, I, I sincerely thought that was the only topless scene in this movie. Oh, no. There's but a there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of it in this movie. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a nudity-filled movie. It's a... It's a... Prof- <laughs> Gypsies. It's a profane movie. Yeah. 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 Um, 
the last thing I'll say, obviously, it's we're, we're talking Kelly Maroney movies, and we'll get back to that. Spicoli's yes. the best part of this movie. <laughs> yeah, he's one of my favorite movie stoners. He easily top five movie stoner of all time. He's the best character in this movie. Anytime he's on the screen, I'm loving the movie. I'm like, this is great. Need more Spicoli. Hey, there's no birthday party in here for me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Han, what are you doing here? <laughs> oh, man. Everything with him and Mr. Han. Like, I could have just watched a movie where it was those two. Yeah. And they're like, they're war with each other. <laughs> The scene with the car where uh, he's got Forrest <laughs> Whitaker's little brother in the yeah. car. <laughs> my brother's going to kill us. He's going to kill us. Oh, man. My brother's going to shit. Well, what's he well, going to do, gonna man? Do, man? Shit or kill us. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Over here, it's, dude. <laughs> it's Again, my favorite, you, my you, favorite you, Sean Penn performance. It, easily, yeah. yeah. <laughs> milk? Milk what? It's this movie. It's Fast Times. Even yeah. we he even get a Nicholas. Ca- so everybody in this movie is yeah. famous. Oh, Nicholas yeah. Cage is in this movie. Yep. And as soon as I popped up, I, I I sort of remembered that he was in this movie. Yep. But as soon as he popped up, I'm like, oh my god, it's Nicholas Cage. Like they don't. He has no lines in this movie. He's there he for a couple scenes. Around, he just stands around Judge Reinhold, and when uh, when he's getting fired at the when he's in that like in that standoff at the. Uh, burger joint and gets fired like nick cage is just behind there there's just that really funny shot of his eyes going wide and him just ducking down behind yeah. The... <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's funny because like he doesn't have a lot of lines but i feel like and maybe it's just because like you're looking for him because it's nick cage and yeah nick cage now is nick cage but like he's got really funny reaction shots in this yes yeah. He, okay, so it, it's only because I watched these movies so close together, Ghoulies 3 and Fast, <laughs> Fast Times. There's a lot of crossover between the two, mostly because they're they're sex comedies. Yeah. Um, but Nicolas Cage is a lot like Matthew Lillard in that movie, where they don't <laughs> okay. have any lines, but they have funny reactions, and it's very clear that it's like their first, first yep. movie ever. Yep. Oh God. Like there are times where he's just like standing there and I'm like, I don't think he's even acting. I think he's just being Nick Cage, like hanging out with his buddies on yeah. set. <laughs> he's in the I think he's in the crowd in the football scene too. Yeah, I think he's, so. I he's think making so. cage reactions to everything. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I I get not loving fast yeah. times because it doesn't I think there's still an incredible amount of nostalgia for me. And I think Spicoli as a character is just he's like the best. He's the best. He, he just, I don't know. And those are the moments that I remember the most out of this movie is like Spicoli. And I mean, the judge Reinhold burger burger joint stuff is all pretty good too. <laughs> I love and how all the different jobs he, he has, all the different jobs he has in the movie. He's yeah. <laughs> And I, I love his whole I life. Love, I love the he's convenience gonna... store robbery at the end. That was so funny. I was not expecting that. Yeah, it's insane. There's so many like weird choices, especially in the last like 20 minutes that this movie yeah. makes. Um, but yeah, I uh, I love how Judge Reinhold is just he's a he's a successful like what does he say like a, a successful guy or something. He's yeah. He, he can't be, he needs to be free and then he loses his job and when his girlfriend breaks up with him literally saying the same thing that he's been saying mm-hmm. <laughs> about breaking up with her he's so offended by it <laughs> it's so funny to watch the tables get turned on him because he's kind of a jerk throughout like you know yeah. what i mean like he has a few redeeming moments you know but like he feels like an actual person yeah, yeah. Like he's a high school kid who's still figuring his shit out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He has he has his moments, but he's not know. a complete terrible person like Damone. Like Damone, yeah. <laughs> like Damone is just a sleaze ball. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. He's a little bit like so like Damone is I mean, he's a less psychopathic, maybe. No, he's about as psychopathic as Ben Affleck, I think. Um in Daisy Oh, even Confused. more so. Yeah. And then, like, yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah. Um, 
Ben and Affleck's then, just paddling like freshmen. Yeah, he's just he's a jerk, but he's pad, he's only paddling <laughs> freshmen. That's all yeah, he's doing. That's true. Damone is doing far worse stuff. Yeah, yeah. Damone is icky. Yeah, he's, he's icky. Gross. He's gross. He's a terrible human being. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's talk about the last '80s Kelly Maroney movie here. Yes, and then we'll kind of use this as our transition to like I want to talk about like the transition from like '80s Scream Queen till now because this is kind of the that point right here. Because zero, what what year was Zero Boys? Um, I want to say it's like '87. Is it after Chopping Mall and it's after. I'm pretty sure. Let me because in terms of like our, our chronological order here, it's fast. She was on a. 86, so it's actually the same year as Chopping Mall. Okay. Because Kelly was on a, a soap opera, and then yes. was Fast Times, Night of the Comet, Chopping Mall, and Zero Boys. Correct. Yep, yep. So. You watch this. I haven't watched this yet. I had never heard of Zero Boys until we actually met Kelly, and I saw she was, like, selling copies at her table, and I had never heard of the movie before. But you watch this. It has yes. not. I don't think it has a cult following really it's one of those ones that has kind of fallen between the cracks it hasn't gotten to the peak of like chopping mall or night of the comet if it yeah if it does have if it does have a cult following it's a smaller one than both of those movies yeah fright rags uh, isn't selling a zero boys t-shirt yeah exactly exactly for that matter they're not selling a night of the comet t-shirt either they should they should, really they, sh they should do yeah that. those would yeah sell. um so yeah i I watched this and prep for this episode and because it's been on my watch list for a while, uh, it sounded interesting. It sounds, it sounded a little bit like a little bit like the warriors, but in a survival kind of situation. And you no, I don't think you could say that. I haven't even seen the warriors yet. I'm still on it. I'm still going to get to it. Watch but the like, warriors. God damn it. So it follows these like three guys who are like paintballers. Okay. And they go, they like win a paintball tournament and they go on this celebratory trip with their girlfriends, one of whom is Kelly Maroney. And all three of these guys are just kind of like douchey, like just kind of douchey to the, the women. And they're like, they're, they're not very of, fun. Are they a bunch they're just of like, moans? A little bit. And it's just kind of like, they like think they're hot shit because they can paintball. And, like, maybe it's just because, like, I'm not a sports person. But I'm kind of like, I don't know. I just didn't find anything to latch on to the three, like, lead boys. Is paintball a sport? I don't know. It, they act like it's a okay. sport. <laughs> so, like. Even so, worse. So, they go to this, like, they go to this cabin. And they're they're having a fun camping trip where they're just going to have sex and drink beer. And someone's deciding to. Like, they find out that the cabin they're staying in has, like, these hillbilly freaks that are, like, hunting people that come out to this cabin. Okay. But the hillbilly freaks aren't really even hillbilly freaks. They're not, like, back normal backwoods people. They have, like, fucking polos on. Like, they look... They're dressed like yuppies, but they look like hillbillies. And, like, Kelly Maroney is just a damsel in distress for most of this. Mm. So her character, when you're introduced to her, like the leader of the zero boys wins her in a bet against the leader of the other team that they just beat. Okay. Which is a really weird thing. And like, they try and make it. So like Kelly's like, Oh, you don't, you don't get to own me. Like, that's not how it works. And then she just goes with the guy anyways. I'm like, what? Mm. So right away I was kind of like, ew, <laughs> like, why do that? Why do that? That's weird. Uh, just make her the guy's girlfriend. Yeah. That's such a weird thing to put in the movie. So, okay. I got, I pulled up Kelly Maroney's IMDb, but the Sorority Babes 2 trailer's playing and it's distracting me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, this, uh, I don't know. This movie isn't very memorable. Like, it's just three of these like yuppie paintball dudes who for some reason can put live rounds in their paintball guns now. Like they just put live rounds in their they're armed to the teeth against these like two or three guys that just have knives. So there's not a whole lot of tension either because I'm like, oh. you can just shoot them. But like they're really stupid about everything. And 
I don't know. By the end of this movie, I was just kind of like, why? You know, like they give kind of, they give Kelly a little bit of like a hero moment at the end, but it's very short lived because like the guy comes back. Cause you know, the killer always comes back. It's a little slashery and it's a little Rambo. Mm-hmm. But then she's like, the guy comes back and she's right back to quivering behind her boyfriend again. And then they let him get the final kill. And I'm just like, Judge the movie for what you get, not what you want. But I'm also like, you don't cast Kelly Maroney in something and then like. Give her nothing to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just, she's better than this movie. She's, and she's giving a better performance than this movie deserves because she's very good in it. She's very entertaining. Mm -hmm. Like it's Kelly Maroney. She always gives that little, like she just has that extra something, right? That makes her imminently watchable. Yes. But if she was not in this movie, I don't know if I would have finished it. I ended up giving it like two and a half stars. It's fine. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's not one that I ever feel like I need to watch again. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It pains me to say that because like I said, I love Kelly. I just, this movie itself wasn't my thing. I didn't think it was quite up to par with some of the other things that she's this streaming anywhere. I think I watched on yeah I watched it on Tubi oh, I watched it on makes, Tubi yeah that makes sense so, I was yep. gonna say Night of, Night of the Comet and Night Chopping Mall are both on there like yeah yeah uh, Fast Times so, is on Paramount might be I own that I one think so. that's, <laughs> I think that's how I watched it on Paramount yeah that would make sense um, so that was the last one in the eighties that we're gonna talk about and let's kind of we're gonna transition to modern day obviously she does have stuff. In between, have you watched any of this, Some, especially like the 90s filmography that she has? I There's even not. some late 80s stuff. So like she's she's the star of uh, Not of This Earth from 88. Yeah. which uh, is tra- also directed by Wynorski. Okay, well, we need to watch that one. Uh, yeah. Transylvania Twist, which was 89. Yeah, I've not uh, seen that. I've heard of this one. I haven't watched it. This is much like... Linnea Quigley's horror workout. The Scream Queen Hot Tub Party. Scream Queen Hot Tub Party, which yes. is her and Brink Stevens and Michelle Bauer. And we need to watch that one. Um, yeah, I've been trying to find that one. It's, so it's got to be on TV. It. Tubi, right? No? Maybe we can try, but I don't. Okay. I think it was like a TV special, and sometimes Tubi doesn't get those. Yeah. But really, like, there's not a whole lot after 91 that she's in besides, you know, once every couple of years she's in something and then we get it's really within the last i don't know three four years that kelly has really made a comeback yeah and i think it's because let's talk about that a little and i i do want to ask kelly that when we when we get to speak with her again in october you know maybe she either it was a hollywood thing where hollywood again we can talk about this wasn't casting a lot of women who were in their forties, fifties at the time yeah, in movies. And we talked about, well, especially why in the nineties, early two thousands, why? Cause they were focusing on the, the teen heartthrob. Right. Scream Queens um, of because... that time. But really within the last five years, I think horror fans are the ones that have pushed this. And I think it's a lot of horror filmmakers who grew up with, Stuff like Chopping Mall, Night of the Comet. Oh, yeah. At least for Kelly Maroney movies. We can talk about other ones as well, like the Halloween movies, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. You know, we're seeing a lot of these classic Scream Queen icons come back. Barbara Crampton being, I think, I would I would say she's the one that really pushed us think- into the modern era. I think Your Next doesn't get enough yeah. credit for what it did. Your next, it that feels movie like that's so... the start of like where we are now. Yeah, ten years later, twelve years later now. Because your next, like you could almost argue that your next is more important to modern horror than like I know a lot of people say like a twenty four midway through the twenty tens is what like really kick started indie horror and like the like resurgence and like how horror has been brought to the mainstream. And to an extent, I a- agree. A24 is the reason you get the critically acclaimed stuff. Hereditary get out. Yes. The yeah. more award buzzy type of, 
I hate elevated horror. I hate that term so much. Yes. But that's where you get that type of stuff. The, like, the more like drama horror. Yeah. Right. But like the scream queen, like the throwback retro y, like bit of bringing a, back these these like horror icons that yep. you love. And a bit of a meta in. twist on them. On them yeah. And, and and for that, I mean like that was I watched your next before I watched reanimate. You know, like okay, that, yeah. your next was actually like, I was like, oh, Barbara Crampton. Like a lot of people are talking about Barbara Crampton being like a huge scream queen, you know, um, because we grew up in that like era of the 90s and early 2000s where like a lot of these like 80s cult classics, at least to me, weren't like readily available. Yeah. I discovered a lot of these in my adulthood through like back when Netflix actually had good horror selection and things like that, you know. I mean, it's um, because of Shutter. Like, for me, it's Shutter. Yeah, and, and like, and, now it's and Shutter. Tubi are, Shutter are and kind Tubi. Of the, yeah, I'm, I'm with you because we're, I mean, both of us, you're 30, I'm 28. We were born in the mm-hmm. 90s. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't have this stuff available. Now that I think of it, I think you're right. I think I've seen, obviously, I've seen your next before I watched Reanimator or yeah. Chopping Mall. You know, before I had seen 80s Barbara Crampton. Yeah, and I mean, I remember watching, like, your next hearing like oh barbara crampton's like a legendary actress like a lot of people were excited about her comeback watching the movie going like oh my god she's really good and then going back and like i think that's the beauty of it is like without stuff like your next or you know scare package too like there are horror fans today that might not even think to go back and look at some of these like classic movies but because these screen queens and these like horror icons are having resurgences now, mm-hmm. it's also like it's also helping that back catalog get discovered. And I think that's really cool. And I think it's cool to like actually admit that, like, you know, yeah, my first Barbara Crampton movie was a movie that came out in 2011. I didn't know who she was before that. Mm-hmm. doesn't make me less of a horror fan. I went back and now reanimators like one of the movies I've probably watched the most in my adulthood, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think, and I think Barbara's talked about this. She wasn't getting offered anything, and she went to go be a be a mom, which is yeah. great. Yeah. But now, and then she was at a point in 2011 where Adam Wingard and, and uh, Simon Barrett could go to her and be like, "Why aren't you in more stuff? You want to be play the mother in this?" Yeah. And I I even hear like Danielle Harris talk about this on her podcast where she went from a teenager to a mom. There was no in between. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, you could argue the same for Barbara Crampton, where she's playing like a college age in Reanimator. Castle Freak, she's playing a mom, though. I guess we still get that. But she goes from like a young mom or a college age student Reanimator to yeah. she's now the mom of like teenagers, twenty year olds. Yeah, yeah. And she's. I mean, you, you can say the same as we're talking Kelly Maroney here. The same with scare package or sorority babes she's the she's she's the alpha she's the one leading the younger generation in those movies and she's so uh, good at like she's so good my favorite thing about kelly is like her her early like when she was a teen like when you watch chopping mall and and um night of the comet she's like very sweet she's very like you know, like she plays these like kind of wholesome characters. Like she's got a little bit of like sass in in Night she has of the a Comet. Lot of sass. Yeah, yeah, and all like, of them. Yeah, that's true. But like, there's also like this underlying like that's innocence charming. to it. Yes, she's like almost turned that off completely in recent years in favor of like playing like grizzled, like ha, kind of kind of like grumpy. Not grumpy. That's not the right word. But like sorority babes, she's like very she's, much like she's you leaning put into out the full more. sass. The, <laughs> yeah. the full sass. Yeah, 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 exactly. And she's like, she's allowing herself to be kind of like this. Yeah, like this sassy old lady that doesn't take any shit type of thing. Like yes. a take no prisoners type of performance every time. Um, like scare package too she's got all these quips she's just like so Mm -hmm. she just seems so disinterested and like all of like why is this happening yeah (laughs) and it's great like i love that um i can see that there's a very clear through line for me from 80s kelly maroney to 2020s kelly maroney oh characters that she's playing they feel very very similar 
like, like all of her kids almost. Yeah, it feels like yeah. they like like Allison or what's her name in Night of the Comet? Uh, Sam. Sam. Yeah. Like <laughs> they seem very similar. One of them is more sassy than the other one and outgoing. Yeah. But they're very, very similar still, where you can still see that through line in Scare Package 2 and Sorority Babes 2. Yeah. Oh, man. she She's my favorite part of Sorority Babes 2. She is. Yeah. Like, she's so good in it. And I love the scene where she's like, she's talking to the, one of the sorority girls and she says something along the lines of like, we were so much looser than you guys back in your day. You just need to sleep with people or yeah. something like along those lines. And I'm just like, God, that's so funny. <laughs> she is so perfectly cast in both and both scare package two and sorority babes too. Yeah. Oh, where yeah. she elevates both of those movies for me. I think she's the best part of both of them. I actually would agree with that too. Um, I think we've talked about both of these movies on the show in like our recent watches. We have, because I feel like both of us have watched these since we started this podcast. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think the both Scare Package 2 was last year, right? It's December of 2022? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Towards the That's end of right. the year? That's right. Yeah. And then Sorority Babes technically was a 2022. Like, no, I mean, IMDb. Was it? Was okay. It was this year. IMDb yeah. says 2022 still, but that's yeah. always hit or miss. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorority Babes is just... I, I like Scare Package 2. I don't love it like I did the first. Yeah. Um. There's... I do think the wraparound segment is my favorite part. Um. And I think it's because, like, there are some great performances from, like, Kelly Maroney. Um, She's unfortunately s- small spoilers for Scare Package 2. She's not in the whole movie. Yeah, yeah. They kill her a little early for my taste. Yes, and it hurts, um, it hurts the movie for me. And again, yeah. I love the first movie. I, I love the team behind Scare Package. Oh, yeah. Both of them, yeah. I, on and off screen, everybody involved, love love that entire crew. It just... It, it, well, some movies, I some think movies it, work for someone and some movies don't. Yeah, like, you know what I mean? It's all subjective. I, I guess the biggest thing I'm saying in this is why not have more Kelly Maroney? Yeah. yeah. Right? That's where I think Sorority Babes 2 works better than like Scare Package 2. She's in the entire movie. Yeah. She's she's there like through the opening with the girls in the sorority house. And then she even shows up at the bowling alley at the end. Yeah, it's I think it's the perfect use of someone like Kelly Maroney or where you're bringing in these mm-hmm. screen Queens, these horror icons to kind of like usher in a new era or, or at least new characters yeah. into a world you're already s- familiar with where you use them for a setup and then you bring them back at the end. I think it's the perfect use of that. Yep. But you know, now that, now that we've had her like supporting in multiple movies that are, that have come out recently, I really want to see her get a 10 minutes to midnight or a Jacob's wife or you know what? I'm actually going to get really specific and say, I want Kelly Maroney to front a feminist vampire movie. Like my two other favorite 80s yeah. scream queens, <laughs> like legit. She'd kill it. She'd mm-hmm. kill something like that. Yeah. You know, make it different enough. Like 10 minutes to midnight and Jacob's wife are two completely different movies saying two completely different things. Mm-hmm. But if you could find a third angle that's like specific to Kelly and her persona, oh, I think that would be so cool. I'm just going to throw out a pitch here that I want to see because I'm in that mood right now of subspecies. Oh, yeah. Do it. She's already in the, in the Full Moon family with Sorority Babes 2. Give they're her a ta- subspecies movie. They're, they're talking about a sixth, a sixth subspecies movie. What if she's... Let her play Radu's love interest in modern time. Oh, I was going to say make another prequel, but make it about mummy. Or let her play mummy. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's mine, too. <laughs> oh, dude, but yeah. I, I want to see Radu back as like a full vampire, Radu. Yes. Let yeah. her play like the love interest. In that would that. be cool. Yeah. That would be cool. Maybe Radu has moved on from, uh, from Michelle and now has a new love interest, Kelly Maroney. Yes. And they're oh, both yeah. going after Michelle. And you can play this like, 
like a know. Bonnie and Clyde type of sitch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're two vampires in love on the run. On the run. <laughs> and on the run in Romania, just killing people and taking their blood. Someone should do a Bonnie and Clyde vampire movie. Although yeah. it probably has already happened low budget somewhere. I'm sure. But we could do a better one. <laughs> <laughs> Bonnie and Vlad. Bonnie and Vlad, yes. <laughs> <laughs> bloody and bloody and Vlad, Bonnie, Bl- no, <laughs> no, cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that. Cut that. Uh, yeah, I think we, I, I, we're gonna get more Kelly Maroney. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. She's been I, working a lot. I mean, we just talked about two horror releases from the last year. Yep. She's in a, a a short film that we are going to play at Supercon as well. Yep. I think we're going to see filmmakers start to embrace the 80s horror icons, the actresses especially, the final girls that are just as iconic as the the horror villains sometimes more so. Oh yeah. And bringing those those actresses back and I think they have a huge popularity behind them especially someone like Barbara Crampton's been doing that like we said since you were next. And yep. now has a couple leading performances. She's going to be in the next Joe Lynch movie. Yeah. I mean, she's executive producing things too. Like, yeah, she's, I mean, she, she wore like a whole she, bunch of different hats. She's on, doing on a ton Jacob's of stuff. life. Yeah. She's doing a ton of stuff on shutter too. Kelly is as well. Yeah. Caroline. And she's like, and she like Barbara is also, uh, she's writing for Fangoria. She's like a yep. regular contributor now. Yep. You know, it's just, it's awesome to see the horror community rally around people that have been there since day one. You yep. know, like once you're in, you're in, we take care of our own yes. and we, like, we you're accept welcome you anytime. one of us. We accept yeah. you one of us. <laughs> it's the best cult you could ever be a part of. <laughs> yep. We have snacks and blood. <laughs> And sometimes boobies. Oh, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> if you're if you're a full moon movie. <laughs> yeah, all the time. So yeah. Even the new subspecies movie does. Does it really? Yeah, yeah it does. That doesn't surprise me no. one bit. Anyway. Uh yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's I mean, let's give it up for, for Kelly Maroney. I mean yeah. an icon, a a a a, a presence in horror a presence in film that is still felt to this day and yeah. Le- she has left a legacy that uh, I think she can be proud of and that horror fans and movie fans in general have have latched onto gravitated towards and have accepted as part of them yeah. we're examples of that I mean oh 100% and I just I mean you know 2020 when when lockdowns were happening I swear, I probably watched Chopping Mall like <laughs> probably twenty times. Yes, yeah. I just it's it's one of those it's a comfort. movies. Yeah, it is. It is. And it, Night of the Comet. I know it isn't that for you, but like Night of the Comet is another one. Like I I, I pop on just about any time. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I've I've, I've watched. I've thrown on Sorority Babes too in the background. I have too. I, I have too. Yeah, it's fun. It's a fun movie. So I yeah. I just, it's really cool that we are getting her at Supercon. I'm, I'm still in a little bit of like shock maybe. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I'm very hyped, but I'm trying not to get too hyped because you just, I don't know. I'm, I'm pinching myself. I am. I, I, I'm going to hype. I'll probably hype you up again here just cause you're already hyped up for this. I am too. Yeah. But I'm going to play the hype man right now for everybody else out there listening. Obviously, you're two hours into this. We've talked a lot of horror. We have talked about yes. so many different types of, of horror in this. We've talked about pretty much every Kelly Maroney movie in existence. We've mm-hmm. ranted and raved about her entire career. We have to say, like, this this event coming up in end of September, October, it's, it's one to, if you're from... Obviously, if you're from Sioux Falls, you have no excuse. You better be coming to this. Yeah. If you're from Iowa, Nebraska, North Dakota, anywhere else in South Dakota, Minnesota, I don't care if you're in California, if you're in Texas, if you're in New York listening to this, this is an event you you can make an entire experience out of and something oh, yeah. you, you can come to. Obviously, we're hyping the film festival because that's our 
That's our baby. We have some incredible things planned. There's huge guests coming to this. I mean, like we have said and announced on our show, our specific film festival guests include Kelly Maroney, Caroline Williams. Also, there's so many other guests that have been at Sean Gunn, who is part of the the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He's a guardian of the galaxy. Yeah. Jim Cummings, who is a icon of animation and voice acting, who's in a movie we talked about on this podcast, too. He's on he's in Scooby Doo on Zombie Island. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's so many. I mean, there's voice actors from from Pokemon. There's yep. wrestlers, professional wrestlers that have yet to be announced that we know. I'm very excited for. Yep. Those are coming. We have more to to be announced for the film festival for crying out loud. Yeah, we're not even done. Do. And that's I'm going to leave a, a little tease for that. We're not done announcing what movies we're playing or what guests we have for the film festival yet. We're yep. not even done, and we have announced two of our favorite horror icons ever coming to, to yep. supercon with kelly maroney and caroline williams i'm not done i'm not done guys this is crazy it's gonna be the biggest film event of the year at least in sioux falls i, I won't yeah. <laughs> in the state of south dakota it's easily the, the biggest film event of the year yep yep it and is we've one... got we've got so many cool like shorts from not just local but like all around yes like... i was gonna say uh the the haunted baby carriage from hell um mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember. It's uh, J.T. Seaton, I think, is, I believe, is the the director of that. I'm not sure where he's from. He might be um, from w- w- West Coast. I don't remember. But like, we're, we're we're playing movies from literally all around the world. We have a movie we're we're looking at from uh, overseas. Like, we're, we're playing anything and everything. So much of it is so cool. We've watched most of the shorts that have been sent to us already, and there are some incredible ones in there. And we are very excited to to be putting this on and putting this together for everyone. It's something you are not going to want to miss. No, not at all. We, I mean, like we've got. We're programming a film festival you and I want to go to. So yeah, if you like, like... The, the same stuff we do, I'm, I'm pretty sure I even told you like a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, God. I kind of wish I wasn't even working this film fest so I could just go to so it. So you could just go to it. And that's <laughs> I think that's the beauty of what we're putting together is something like you and I would be ecstatic even if we were just going to it. Yeah, exactly. We're we're literally putting this we're putting this film festival on for the people like us because we know South Dakota's kind of a desert for stuff like that. And if we can, we're going to bring this to you guys yeah. because it's cool. It's something we're passionate about. We love doing it. And uh, hopefully you guys do too. Yeah. So if you love our ranting and ravings about horror movies and nonsense on, on here, you're going to lose your mind at this film festival. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's going to be one for the ages. It like is, yeah. I'm, it's going to be a, like last year was incredible. I mean, we just yeah. to kind of, we're, I don't care. We're, we're going to rant and rave about, last year's right now i'm gonna do it yes last year we had third we played 13 fanboy which was deborah Voorhees yep. film her baby that she made about fans of the friday the 13th franchise and and mm-hmm. the people that the people that we are talking about the icons of the 80s that are coming back yeah she brought them back in that movie and we had the pleasure of playing that with with deborah there yeah with ron with deborah. From, from friday part five junior himself with CJ Graham, Jason freaking Voorhees from Friday the 13th Part 6. We showed yep. the never-ending story with Noah Hathaway. Yeah. Like the, the Atreyu from Never Ending yep. Story. And here I, I'm going to say this year's festival is even bigger. It is. It's even bigger. It's. I'm not going to say it's better because I think that's subjective and relative. Yeah. And it's not a competition. But it's the shiny new one. And so I yes. can say that I'm more excited about it mainly because the other ones have already happened. It's already happened. You can't happened. be, you can't be, about... you can't be excited yeah. about something that's already happened. <laughs> yeah. <yet. laughs> so, so yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm stoked for this year, guys. Like it's going to be, it's going to be insane. Um, and you'll probably see me at some point at multiple points during the weekend, walking into an empty room to cry because I'm like, it feels like a dream come true, honestly, already. So <laughs> mm-hmm. so if you are interested and you want to stay up to date on everything going on, obviously we'll share more stuff as we get closer to the event on our social medias, which Sam will plug yep. here in a minute. But go follow Supercon on their social medias, on Facebook especially. That's kind of their 
main hub for announcing yep. everything. Uh, just Supercon, S I O U X P E R C O N, Sioux, as in like Sioux Falls, um, yep. per con. That's how you can find us. Uh, supercon.com, spelled the same way, S I O U X P E R C O N.com. That's where you can find the latest on the entire list of events and guest announcements. And we will have our entire film festival schedule on there probably very shortly. We're, I was about we're, to say, probably pretty soon. We're finalizing it. Yeah, we're, we're getting the, the final details already for it. And again, that's September 29th through October 1st, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We are going to be showing films all three days of the festival. Yep. So be on the lookout for anything and everything else we have yet to announce. It's going to be a good one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Moving into plugs for the show. Yes. yes. If you like this and you want more, and let's face it, you like this and you want more. because You want you, more. Yeah. You've listened to us for two hours and five minutes. Like, you're hooked on this show. Just admit it. Um, <laughs> you like us. You really like us. You like us. <laughs> um, so if you like us and you want to see more, uh, you can subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and Anchor. And if you like watching, we also post every video or every episode on YouTube with video. Um, where Casey shows off some of his stuff. And I, you know, occasionally refer to back here where I have like Mr. Stay Puffed and stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and a ton of VHS tapes I have not even seen. Yes, I know. We gotta, we gotta set up a VHS swap sometime. Yeah. It'll be fun. It'll be fun to look through each other's VHSs. Um, so yeah, that's where you can subscribe to the podcast. You can also follow us on socials, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, when Joe Bob comes back, I'll be live tweeting again uh, during last drive-in episodes from our handle. I love doing that. Join us for that. It's so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah. Sam. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, Sam, before we, we end this thing, uh, do we have a, an idea of what we're doing next episode? I don't think so. I don't think so. I only say that because moving forward, we've talked about this. We're going to be doing our podcast basically live. We're going to stream these on on Facebook and YouTube and then post them on our podcast feeds that Friday, what, yeah. whatever day we re record these, usually on Mondays or Tuesdays. Um, so you'll be able to tune in live and you can live chat with us and stuff. But I say that's because we're, we'll... We're looking for ideas. We want some more ideas of what topics we should cover. Yeah. You want some broad scope topics, kind of like today's where we talked about anything and everything in Kelly Maroney's filmography. Or do you like the the more niche topics where we talk about, you know, a single movie or two movies or broad topics, crazy ideas like we did with the tier ranking of slasher villains and stuff like that. Yeah. So if, if you're out there and you want to leave us a comment on wherever you can on our social medias or on YouTube, Shoot us an email, screams from the basement pod at gmail.com. You can do it that way as well. Or reach out to Sam or I directly. Yeah, absolutely. With, with your ideas. Let us know. We want some we want some more topics because I don't think we have anything planned for a couple months in terms of like a set topic. Yeah, yeah. We've got a few episodes that we have planned for like later on, closer to Supercon and stuff. Yep. But beyond that, like we we're always looking for like what you guys want to hear. Um yeah, because we like we like switching it up, but we wanna mm -hmm. we wanna know. I don't know. What do you guys like? What do you want to hear us talk about? What do you want to hear us get nerdy and sweaty about? Do you want another Kelly Maroney episode? I'll talk about Kelly Maroney every episode if you want. Yeah, like. We'll do it. <laughs> we'll just start calling it Kelly Maroney. <laughs> Kelly Maroney. I couldn't think of a. I couldn't think of another. Full thing. full moon. I don't know because that's all I will talk about ever. So if you want more full moon movies, we'll do it. I don't care. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, let's wrap this thing up before we start yeah. rambling into nonsense, which we already have. <laughs> Sam. Right. I don't know what, what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to end the hey, show. We're Screams from the Basement. Thanks for listening that, in. That's Sam. <laughs> I'm Casey. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. And sweet, sweet screams. screams. Bye-bye. Bye. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. 
the PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening.